A very good morning to all the participants of BAR 2020. I welcome you to the fourth day of our workshop. Let me take the opportunity to introduce to our esteemed expert, Dr. Kaushik Guha. I welcome you, sir, to our workshop BAR 2020. A brief introduction, <coughs> Dr. Kaushik Guha. He is an optimistic researcher and assistant professor in Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, NIT Center. <coughs> he has found knowledge in MEMS, NEMS, VLSI design, analog circuit design, and VLSI. He is a great leader and team worker, leading successfully his department for long 10 years. He is now an Associate Dean of Students Welfare in NIT Filter. He has been running National MEMS Design Center in NIT Filter with an upliftment passion. MEMS Lab is helping <coughs> in the department by support of so many research scholars to pursue their load. His profound interest towards MEMS designing has made him as the one of the leading researcher not only in NIT Silchar, but in the country with research articles with high reputed journals. He has published more than 50 journal papers in IEEE, Springer, Elsevier, etc. 60 conference papers in national and international conferences, around 10 book chapters. He has authored one book on noise in RF MEMS switch, modeling and simulation. Dr. Guha is a senior member of IEEE and is a member of many professional bodies like IEI, SECI, POSET, IIAM, etc. He has been an active and regular reviewer of SCI, SCI journals and various IEEE hosted sponsored conferences. Teaching is the heart of Dr. Guha. He deals with classes with exceptional sincerity and motivation. He believes in students are builders of next world-class technology. He has received number of awards like Sardar Ballabhai Patel National Reformer Award 2018, Outstanding Faculty in Engineering under VIFA 2018, Institute of Scholar Research Excellence Award 2020, Institute of Scholar Young Achievers Award 2020, to name a few, Dr. Guha has been involved in a number of R&D projects from various government organizations like Special Manpower Development Project from Mighty Government of India, Horizon 2020 funded international project with Tidal National Inst uh, Institute of Ireland and has been associated with it since long time. Dr. Guha delivered many lectures in conferences, sem seminars, FDPs and training programs. He is currently supervising eight number of PhD scholars in the field of MEMS and VLSI. His current research areas includes mimicking human body functions using MEMS technology, RF MEMS, bio MEMS, MEMS energy harvesting, design and development of smart sensors for IoT, VLSI circuit design and optimization. With this short bio of Dr. Koshi Guha, I would like to request Dr. Guha to take up on the session and continue with his talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank so this you. This is a great opportunity to talk to something about my research area and also the researches of NIT Silicon to the outside world. This is a good forum. So thank you for inviting me for this. So let me share the screen. Yes, sir. So you stop there. Can you please stop this sharing? Yes, 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 sir. I have stopped. Now this slide is visible. Sir, it is visible. Okay. So if you can kindly do it in a presentation mode. Yes, yes, yes. Ah. Now, now it is okay. <clears throat> Sir. So uh, today actually this topic, uh, the topic that uh, just I have started uh, 
not a, a very deep study because uh, we have started very recent type of work on this domain. So it is the lens engineered human organ mimicry devices. So I'll be talking on this special focus on the kidney because today's uh, at the uh, this, the present situation is been going on the pandemic type of thing. So everybody, all the uh, medical practitioners, doctors, and the academia also, the person from the industry also, we are joining hand together, and we are also day by day we are finding the best possible solution how to combat this type of diseases in future. Also. So also at the same time, we have to be very alert for our own human physiological systems. We have to take the proper precautions. We have to take the proper medications. We have to consult with the proper medical practitioners and the doctors. So how to, because human life is very, very precious. And I think we have to do by, uh, for any kind of, uh, we should not uh, leave, it, uh, leave any uh, stone unturned to make our body fully uh, uh, in correct order. So for, uh, due to this, uh, actually this present situation, I, I find this topic is very, very relevant. So that's why I'm interested to talk on this topic. So first, uh, let me start about uh, with some kind of uh, uh, the uh, statistics type of thing for our healthcare sector. You can see in the slide the global healthcare ta transformation. So, the, so there is a, some uh, health to death. You can see uh, you can see the expenditure part D. So the whole band is divided into four categories. One is the fitness and wellness, then the chronic diseases, then the complex chronic disease and then acute care. And if you can see the uh, the expenditure, it is only for 0 0.3 dollar per day uh, for the fitness and wellness. So under this category, it is consumer fitness, personal uh, exercises, stress management. But if you move on this further, then you will come to the chronic diseases where diabetes, hypertension, this metabolic syndrome that will come into the play. And the uh, expenditure, you can see it is a, just a bit higher than this, it is $3 per day. If you go further, then if you enter into the complex chronic diseases, then there are so many types of diseases that they are very acute diseases. It is heart failure, COPD, cancer, renal. And you can see the there is a high uh, jump of the expenditure per day also, it is $300 per day. And if you go beyond that, so it is unimaginable, it is $3,000 per day for so the expenditure. So, so always, so what is the actually the inference from this type of uh, phenomenon or from this type of diagram is that cost of care is exponentially increasing from people managing their health to complex chronic disease and acute care. So if acute diseases are not manageable, then at least chronic diseases need to be controlled. So we have to uh, actually remain with this with this first band of this entire side carrier, this, at least the fitness and wellness. So we have to be very fit, we have to be very alert, and we have to exercise, and we have to consult with the doctor, and we have to always monitor our body function. So if we can do this in regular basis, then I hope that, of course, we will not move into this higher band or higher uh, the expenditure per day in this region. We will restrict our lifestyle within the very fast band that is only very, very few uh, dollar per day and also we can live happy <clears throat> so now obviously so human body is a very mysterious type of thing you can see because it is one of the best example of the smart kind of system and smart structure because today we are speaking about the smart city smart system smart <laughs> agriculture so everything will be the smart but human body is also the uh, uh, the, uh, also that we have seen the human body so it's very very smart because so many complex physiological uh, operations or the mechanisms are al already in, in embedded in our human body so it can consist of this um, human organism that composed of living cells and extracellular materials and organized into the some tissues organs and systems you can see in the figure the human body consists mainly of water and of organic compounds like the lipids, the proteins, the carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. So, water is found in the extracellular fluids of the body. Actually, it is called the blood plasma. And then, within the also, it can traverse within the cells themselves. So, the uh, the fluid in the form of fluid in our limbs and in all the cells, and the also the uh, in other parts of the body where the, this type of blood plasma or fluid level actually always is passing through. 
it serves as a solvent without which the chemistry of life could not take place so water is uh, actually because in so many complex reaction actually takes place in our human body so uh, the medical uh, practitioner or the doctor or the, uh, who is uh, directly working under this field they are and well explained so what are those chemical reactions but water is a very very important parameter of our human body so the human body is about 60 percent water by weight so most of the weight actually our body weight can be uh, responsible by this water 60 percent of the human body is due to the water and remaining 40 percent for the other parameters <clears throat> now just we can see one uh, the in the slide that i have made one picture of the entire globe and in the right hand side there are also the millions and billions of people are living in the entire globe now if we can move on to this if we can zoom it so our our countries can be located by this yellow color of circle we can see and similarly we can also point out one person among these billions of people by this now if we can draw the analogy between this in our country and also just one people from these billions of people now the picture will be like that so in our country also there are so many states so many cities so many things as are there so similarly so one state that is very very important and very very uh, cultural heritage okay is involved in this state that is assam it is also there in our country but if you draw the analogy like similarly if we can also dissect our our human body then also our human body consists of the so many uh, physiological organs it may be brains it may be our any uh, sense organs like uh, ears nose throat uh, then heart is there then liver is there pancreas then intestine then kidneys then so many so many things so many complex kind of human organs the complex behavior of these organs are also seen in our human body now also in the left hand side you can see in the map of the assam so on the map of the assam if we can point out the kachar is a district you know the kachar is the barak valley is the one of the districts under the barak valley which is also is it's a rich cultural heritage the education and everything uh, is there in in this kachar so similarly i can also point out our the very very important one body part that is human kidney like that so both are very very highly important in their own domain because in kachar and the silchar is also very very important for their culture and values and educations and for other kind of socio economic behavior of the uh, our common people likewise so kidney is also one of the very very important organs so it can be responsible for so many important body functions so now if we can zoom it then also we can relate actually the kacha to the entire kidney and then inside the kacha we have a small that nit silchar similarly uh, in our kidney also the the kidney actually is consisting of so many nephrons and that is the and the one of the nephron is actually i can draw the relation between our nit silchar to the nephron so what is the uh, point because i am drawing this uh, analogy because both are very very similar and both are very very important and relevant on their own nature because nowadays our nit silchar is very very pertinent to the whole country and uh, it is highly prestigious one of the institutions in our country also the nirf rank you can see in 2020 it is coming under 46 and also recently uh, that published the uh, auto innovation ranking that our nit silchar is under the band of 11 to 25 Similarly, the nephron also, also the most of the kidney functions, the are depending uh, on the nephron. Nephron is responsible mainly for blood filtration. That is one of the very major importance and work uh, of the kidney. Then water and solute transport because the uh, specific and the good balance between uh, acid and base should be there inside our body. So the nephron is responsible for that. Ultra filtration. That is the suppose in our kidney some uh, waste filled blood is coming and kidney actually will filter this blood and again it will pass the uh, the blood with the fully pure blood and the waste and all the things that is inside present in the blood and then it will be excreted and it will be uh, actually going uh, it will be excreted in the form of the urine so this is the basic phenomenon of the our basic working function of the kidneys and the nephron. 
so now we can see or uh, now we can actually uh, the uh, understand the how the important uh, to know the function of the kidney which is responsible for all the important phenomena uh, actually uh, for our uh, healthy body so kidney is a very very important organ and very very complex also behavior is very very complex both are of high value now we can see the kidney is one of the most highly differentiated organs in the body nearly 30 different cell types form a multitude of filtering cap capillaries <clears throat> the kidney can perform the endocrine function endocrine function just i mean to say it can also make a proper balance of the hormone secretion because you know our uh, body parts and all the cells require some kind of hormones if, we, if the hormones are uh, in proper level are not excreted and not actually absorbed uh, at the proper time so there are so many discrepancies so many malfunctions will be coming in the form of diseases so the uh, hormone uh, balance and hormone secretion is one of the also important function of the kidney then regulation of the blood pressure that uh, the uh, heart the blood pressure also is one of the very severe problem now nowadays uh, in uh, not only in our country across the globe across the globe to, so to maintain and to regulate this blood pressure level inside our body inside our uh, organs inside our cells uh, so the inside our blood vessels so uh, everywhere the also kidney actually performs the uh, the responsible of this type of regulation also the solute and water transport also that i told you in the very first slide is one of the important function of the kidney is the solute and the water transport the proper amount of solute and water should be transported to the every cells otherwise the cell will not alive if the cells will die so if the cells will die then they are india uh, it is a uh, uh, it is coming out in the form of very uh, kind of uh, high type of acute type of kidney failure or kidney disease acid base balance is one of the another word and then the removal of the drug metabolites suppose so the that the drug uh, actually the extra amount of thing suppose in the kidney is full of uh, i think the blood or the plasma and where in the inside the blas plasma fluid we can see there are a lot of uh, actually particles are there like sodium potassium some kind of uh, molecules, uh, some proteins, some algorithms. So all these should be there present in the body in proper form, in proper proportion. Okay, so if uh, the uh, beyond that proportion or uh, the more than the adequate level of this type of substances present inside the body, this is not a good sign of the body. So all these extra type of uh, anything, uh, the, uh, the proteins and algorithms and urine and this kind of thing, that will be coming out, that should be coming out as a form of the urine. So kidney actually will do these functions. So here actually I have uh, uh, here included one kidney video. So let me play this kidney video. Uh, so now at this moment, just I will stop the sharing uh, of this. Then, uh, then I will play, I will try to play one kidney video. A hot day, and you've just downed several glasses of water, one after the other. Behind the sudden urge that follows are two bean-shaped organs that work it is audible. Tuned tuned internal it is audible. They balance the amount of fluid yes, in your sir. body, detect okay. waste in your blood, and know when to release the vitamins, minerals, and hormones you need to stay alive. Say hello to your kidneys. The main role of these organs is to dispose of waste products and to turn them into urine. The body's eight liters of blood pass through the kidneys between 20 and 25 times each day. 
meaning that together, these organs filter about 180 liters every 24 hours. The ingredients in your blood are constantly changing as you ingest food and drink, which explains why the kidneys need to be on permanent duty. Blood enters each kidney through arteries that branch and branch until they form tiny vessels that entwine with special internal modules called nephrons. In each kidney, one million of these nephrons form a powerful array of filters and sensors that carefully sift through the blood. This is where we see just how refined and accurate this internal sensing system is. To filter the blood, each nephron uses two powerful pieces of equipment, a blob-like structure called a glomerulus and a long stringy straw-like tubule. The glomerulus works like a sieve, allowing only certain ingredients, such as vitamins and minerals, to pass into the tubule. Then, this vessel's job is to detect whether any of those ingredients are needed in the body. If so, they're reabsorbed in amounts that the body needs so they can circulate in the blood again. But the blood doesn't only carry useful ingredients. It contains waste products too, and the nephrons have to figure out what to do with them. The tubules sense compounds the body doesn't need, like urea, left over from the breakdown of proteins, and redirects them as urine out of the kidneys and through two long sewers called ureters. These tubes empty their contents into the bladder to be discharged, ridding your body of that waste once and for all. There's water in that urine too. If the kidney detects too much of it in your blood, for instance, when you've chugged several glasses at once, it sends the extra liquid to the bladder to be removed. On the other hand, low water levels in the blood prompt the kidney to release some back into the bloodstream, meaning that less water makes it into the urine. This is why urine appears yellower when you're less hydrated. By controlling water, your kidneys stabilize the body's fluid levels. But this fine balancing act isn't the kidney's only skill. These organs have the power to activate vitamin D to secrete a hormone called renin that raises blood pressure, and another hormone called erythropoietin, which increases red blood cell production. Without the kidneys, our bodily fluids would spiral out of control. Every time we ate, our blood would receive another load of unsifted ingredients. Soon, the buildup of waste would overload our systems and we'd expire. So each kidney not only keeps things running smoothly, it also keeps us alive. Lucky then that we have two of these magical beans. Okay, so let me go back to my slides. Yeah, so that's, so in the very short video, because so that's why I have posted this video, because in the short video, we can also know the, the operations of the kidney in a beautiful manner. So uh, then I think, so now it is clear that how, what is the importance of the kidney and what are the main functions of the kidney. So now there are kidney parts also, you can see the structure of the kidney parts. Now this is first, it's called the cortex. Cortex is the outer region of the kidney. Then medulla, medulla is the inner region of the kidney. Then uh, it contains eight to 12 renal pyramids like that. So it is a medullary pyramid -like type of thing. The medullary pyramid is the formed by the collecting darts in the inner part of the kidney. So many collecting darts will be integrated with each other, it will cross, uh, it will intersect with each other and it make a such kind of structure, kind of, it is a uh, pyramidal structure. Then you, ureter collects filtrate and urine from the renal pelvis and takes into the bladder for urination. Renal artery branches of the aorta being, bringing waste filled blood into the kidney because the one of the major function is the blood Filtration. So first the waste filled blood will be coming into the kidney. Kidney will do filtration and after that pure blood will be supplied to the organs and the cells and uh, through the renal vein. So the function of the renal vein is to remove the filtered uh, that blood from the kidneys into the inferior, the vena cava. So these are some medical terms. So uh, inside the nephron, you can see the structure of the nephron that also uh, we have studied long before also, but now uh, 
also the, those will be working on this area so again we have to start it because nephron there is a very complex function so many things are there in the nephron so the individual eye actually cannot be you cannot see this nephron by the naked eye the nephron is the basic structural and functional unit of the kidney each kidney has about 1 million amount of nephron so it is 1 million number approximately the blood containing urea and metabolic waste product enters the kidney from the liver so from liver this uh, waste filled type of uh, fluid plasma it is coming into the kidney and the job of the kidney it will do the ultra filtration the blood is mechanically filtered to remove uh, fluids and waste and electrolytes acids and bases into the tubular system by leaving the blood cells, proteins, and chemicals in the blood streams. So the job of the main of the job of the kidney is that. So ultra filtration. There are several parts of the nephron, like glomerulus. You can see we have heard about, we have studied about also the glomerulus, then proximal convoluted tubule. You can see this is the proximal tubule, this uh, helix type of structures, this entire structure is. Uh, tubule type of structure is called the proximal tubule, then thin descending limb, ascending limb, then distal convoluted tubule, then cortical, uh, cortical collecting duct, inner medullary collecting duct. So all these things are there. So mainly you now for today's talk, I will concentrate on this glomerulus and the proximal convoluted tubule and how the uh, actually the uh, how to mimic this type of actions in the uh, names and microfluidic environment that just i will try to uh, show some some of the work that we have started very recently on this now also let's talk about some kind of kidney diseases the, uh, that the diseases coming due to the glomerular uh, malfunctioning the tubular then interstitial the renovascular and combination so different diseases are we can see the glomerular uh, glomerular diseases because the glomerular uh, filtration rate is one of the key parameters for the doctor to measure to detect whether your kidney is working or not. In a uh, healthy man, actually, this GFR, uh, the uh, ratio is, I think, uh, above 60. So if the GFR rate is coming below the 15, then it is a very critical stage and it is the uh, symptom of the acute kidney uh, failure. Then the dialysis will be required. Then the some kind of Franconi syndrome, proximal RTA, disorder of the loop of Henle, Barter syndrome, Gittleman syndrome. These are very common kind of syndrome and diseases for a uh, kidney or the nephrologist. They used to handle a lot of patients daily uh, with this type of diseases. Chronic kidney diseases, uh, also called the chronic kidney failure, describe the gradual loss of the kidney function. So chronic means suppose if you uh, if you do not know actually whether your kidney is properly working or not, so, uh, so slowly, slowly, suppose if your kidney actually uh, not working properly, then actually will not know. So in the very first stage, if you have any symptom kind of thing, then you should consult with the doctor and you should detect this failure in the chronic stage. Otherwise, then it will go into the some kind of acute kidney stages and the end stage uh, renal failure. From there, you have a very higher risk of kidney diseases. And, and if you have diabetes, high blood pressure, or a close family member with kidney disease also, then this will also boost your this type of diseases. So uh, the mostly kidney diseases attack the nephrons. This damage may leave the kidneys unable to remove the waste because your filter nephron is not working properly. So obviously, it cannot do the filtration properly. So it cannot remove the waste. So the waste will be remaining in the blood and this waste actually will damage the cells. So that is one form of the diseases. So uh, you have a higher risk of kidney diseases if you have diabetes. So that's why people are very much concerned about the diabetes and the high blood pressure because it can lead to the another type of very acute kidney diseases. The chronic kidney disease damages the nephron slowly uh, over several years. So like a slow poisoning type of things because we do not know but, but inside our body, our kidney is not properly working. Okay, so we do not know. So it's slowly, slowly, then it will damage the cells and the operations. And after that, after so many years, then you will see. So it will emerge out as a big type of diseases. And this is the global scenario. You can see the chronic kidney diseases, the CKD, the, the, the amount of death, which is a figure of 2030. Now you can see the 956246. So this, this is the 
figure of the deaths related, related to the chronic kidney diseases. 134% increase the number of the deaths from CKD to 1992 2030. So, how fast actually the CKD uh, are moving? So, now uh, the uh, uh, very high percentage of people are getting infected with this type of chronic kidney diseases. One in 57 deaths in worldwide due to the CKD. So every 57, okay, uh, one death is due to this chronic kidney failure. 7% of all cardiovascular deaths are attributable to the CKD. In this figure also, it is also kind of good figure. Cardiovascular deaths were attributed to one of the principal CKD markers, low glomerular filtration rate. That's I told you. The glomerular, uh, the glomerular filtration rate is the uh, for it should be above 60 or 65, but if it uh, actually comes lower than the 15, then it is a uh, so situation is highly alarming. So CKD is among the growing cause of age standardized mortality. In Indian scenario, what is the Indian scenario in India? You know, we can see the 17.4 percent of the CKD stage. The, uh, the total and the stage is three, three to five six percent. So CKD has a number of stage: stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and stage five. Okay, so it is not a less than seventeen point four percent of uh, of this uh, our Indian the actually penetrates into the our uh, Indian population. Uh, now, uh, according to the some region of the of our. Uh, country that we can see it is in the left hand side the year of 2001 to 3 and right hand side 2010 to 13 how these red zones are increasing okay and i am sure in 2020 also this will be higher than this so here age standardized death rates are given so red indicates 46 to 65 36 to 45 30 to 35 so even 36 to 45 in this and 30 to 35 also in this also small age also we actually this kidney uh, failure uh, uh, re reported the people are uh, detected with the acute and chronic kidney disease so this is a high alarming situation and we have to uh, take the proper steps and we have to do something to prevent that the prevalence of the kidney patients worldwide with, uh, so the indian figure you can see it is a high alarming with the, uh, respect to the other countries we, we can see in the india 117 uh, patients in million. So India's bar is highest than with respect to all other countries. There are also some increasing uh, that the prevalence estimates of the diabetes by age and sex. You can see the male versus female uh, ratio in the uh, also are here the top five countries for number of people with diabetes in India is the first, then Bangladesh, then Sri Lanka, then Nepal, then Mauritius. Okay. So uh, here, uh, uh, then uh, you can see that the number of diabetics will rise to 642 million by 2014. One in 11 adults have diabetes is in our Indian scenario. 415 million in worldwide. One in three adult diabetics have chronic kidney diseases because uh, if the diabetics are there, so it can lead to the chronic kidney diseases. So these are very, very interrelated. So that's why the diabetes has to be stopped. People have to think how to prevent this type of uh, diabetics or uh, how to lead a healthy life, what type of medications and exercises and the daily routine we have to follow. The no current test that can predict the diabetic kidney disease. So, so far, the, so uh, no current test means there are a lot of tests, but there but accurately prediction of this type of diabetic kidney disease is very, very rare. The kidney disease is one of the major complications of the diabetes the male versus female ratio we can see that the 10.4 percent among men and 11.8 percent among women so women is little bit higher than the men the chronic kidney diseases in the worldwide scenario 850 million people worldwide have some form of kidney disease 2.4 million deaths annually caused by the ckd means chronic kidney disease 1.7 million deaths annually due to acute kidney uh, failure then, so these are the some kind of static trees. So that's uh, you know, because this is important because uh, this is uh, this shows that the world is moving in not in a good uh, direction. Our country is also not moving in the good direction in terms of this type of diseases, and we have to fight back how to stop this kind of diseases. 
the global uh, prevalence of ckd we have seen it is estimated 8 to 16 percent and the disease burden is expected to grow so every day every year it is growing in india it is ranging 4 percent to 17.2 percent with wide regional differences the uh, the ckd is the 12th most common cause of the death and 17 most common cause of the disability 17 percent of indians have chronic kidney diseases reported study by Harvard Medical School in the partnership with 13 medical centers in India, 17% of Indians. End stage renal disease, that is ESRD, represents the ter terminal stage of the CKD and is defined by a glomerular filtration rate of less than 15 milliliter per minute per day. Okay, so less than 15 means it is a LRD. So you are moving into the towards the end stage renal diseases. So as an Indian population will study and determine the food and age adjusted. PSRD incidence rates at 151 and 232 per million population. So these are some of the kidney disease, how the kidney diseases are happening, what are the rates, what is the number of deaths due to this. So what are the diagnosis procedures? The very common test is the blood test. Doctor used to prescribe that the level to detect the level of the waste products in, in the blood, such as creatinine level, urea level. The urine test can one of the also analyzing a sample of a urine. Uh, may reveal because in the urine, suppose if uh, albumin or some other uh, the particles are suppose in, detected in a high uh, concentration, then of course doctors can detect. So there is something inside the kidney, the chronic kidney diseases. Then imaging tests are also there. Your doctor may use the ultrasound to assess your kidney's structure and size. Other imaging tests may be used in some cases. So where uh, the CT scan and other type of imaging with nowadays good. Uh, medical imaging and artificial intelligence techniques the doctors used to uh, take help of this type of test for detection of the diseases and removing a sample of kidney tissue for testing so that is also one kind of test uh, also there to detect the kidney failure now the dialysis techniques also we have heard about the, the dialysis because uh, now we have also heard about in many people are uh, this uh, uh, actually, if we're taking this type of dialysis okay, in their home also. So dialysis is basically when your kidney stop working, then you have to uh, then uh, remove the waste filled blood from your body and you have to uh, fill your blood with fully pure blood. Then you have to take the help from other machines and such kind of big machines okay, with the help of. So this machine will mimic the work of the kidney. But that cannot completely remove the uh, the kidney uh, because one of the work of the kidney like filtration can be possible with this but this type of procedure is not good because it is very time consuming very painful and also it is very costly also in a, in a week three four times in a week that the people has to do the dialysis techniques even in a day also three four hours it will consume so uh, this is a quite not a very feasible and very friendly procedure and it is very painful also. The three times a week, every time two to four hours of treatment, so it will not supply the required amount of solutes. So it is very bulky, the dialysis is the instrument that is very bulky, complicated, it is pain in the treatment, water wastage, less availability of dialysis equipment in hospitals. Most importantly, costly uh, rupees. Uh, you can see five thousand to fifteen thousand. Maybe actually, uh, the uh, you can see the expenditure due to the dialysis. So it cost around seventy-five to hundred per hour. So if you uh, see the cost per hour, it is seventy-five to. So not all the level of people cannot afford this type of costly type of solutions. The kidney transplant. Uh, uh, Kidney transplantation is also there already. Nowadays, we have heard about a lot of transplantation happens. Kidney, maybe liver, maybe heart. Okay. Uh, but successful kidney transplantation offers the best possible quality for light patients with the end stage renal diseases. But the lack of awareness, the low education levels, lack of clear national policy, absence of functional dialysis and transplant units with adequately trained staff, and absence of an organized system of organ retrieval from deceased donors and lack of opportunities to found long-term immunosuppression. So these are the lack, lack of so the awareness is very small, low education levels, lack of a clear national, because we do not have a good national policy that uh, who will give the kidney, who can donate, how to bring the donated kidney 
how to transplant this type of thing. This requires a, 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 some kind of national policy guidelines. So this is also time consuming process. Drug testing, drug testing, we have seen there are a lot of phases in the drugs that phase one discovery, development, phase two, three clinical research, phase three clinical research. Even in phase one also, the phase one, two, three, four, you can see in the, uh, in the uh, there are a lot of phases involved. So it is not like a one day or two day planner and it has to apply a lot of population also and then it is found suitable. Then you can propose that this drug is good for this type of kidney diseases. 2D models and the problem, there are 2D cell culture that also existing, but that are being extensively used in the analyzing all types of body function. But 2D models are not accurate, though the analysis is simple. For this reason, research has shifted to animal model experiments uh, because uh, we have seen the animal model, the, uh, the animal model, uh, but the animal models cannot uh, perfectly mimic or replicate the human physiology because of course our human physiology is something different, very, co very complex. You can predict something if we apply some animal model, but it cannot predict accurately what our human organs actually do. The internal construction of animal organs is different from human organs. So there is no other way than using animal models for live analysis. So first, whenever you will uh, actually uh, invent some kind of dark or kind of thing, then first we have to try to we push it to the animal and then see what is the reaction. After that, if it is found suitable and if it is reported that, okay, no side effects and all, the, everything is going fine, then actually we can focus for the humans. But there is also uh, not a good procedure because in the animal uh, model also we have seen after pushing the drugs into the animal, there are uh, actually the animals actually has to suffer actually a lot of things. So this is not the, I think, uh, also very good procedure to test our drugs into the animals. So the monument, the picture you can see, it is the monument to the laboratory of uh, mouse Russia. So, uh, so this is the mark of the the, it commemorates the sacrifice of the mice in general, genetic research used to understand biological and physiological mechanisms for developing new drugs and curing of this. The animal has to sacrifice their lives actually when this kind of drug testings and uh, procedure is coming into the uh, picture. So for the to commemorate this type of uh, the, uh, animal sacrifice, the, in the Russia this monument is still there. So what is the motivation? The motivation is the kidney disease spreads like slow poison. Uh, the effects of failure are permanent. From the invention of dialysis machine, there is very less research conducted to make it as a user friendly. The funding of research on kidney disease is very less, $29 uh, where as on cancer research, it is $560 uh, and AIDS research $3064. So with respect to the cancer and the AIDS, the expenditure that is incurred out okay, and that is uh, the money that is invested for the kidney research that is very, very less. Hence, there is a desperate need to conduct the research on the development of artificial kidney. So some of the universities in, um, also they are doing, they are uh, conducting some research to how to develop, how to develop the artificial kidney that can be very, very small miniature size. It can be implanted inside the body and then it will mimic the whole body function. But the present problem originated from thought of contributing to kidney failure society by developing new techniques to overcome the problems associated with existing techniques. So what to do? So we have to take the help of technology because the medical doctors and medical team is there. They will obviously uh, know the better physiological functions of inside the body, but also not only medical practitioners and the health community can also uh, solve the purpose, but uh, we have to join the technology person, the person from academia, the research field, they have to join hands with this medical team and then we can do and we can progress towards kind of research and technology. So the first thing that actually this type of small implantable kidney can be supported by the technology which is called the MEMS. Why, why the MEMS? Because MEMS is the acronym and full name is Micro Electromechanical System where the electrical, electronics and the mechanical systems can be embedded or integrated together and to make a beautiful complex system. 
so any engineering system that performs critical and mechanical functions or both with components in micrometer scale so scale is also very very small micrometer scale so in the micrometer scale uh, people can do the wonder with the help of the electrical electronics and also the mechanical but not only limited to this domain means is an interdisciplinary domain where the all kinds of science and engineering branches can participate maybe the instrumentation engineering maybe the electrical uh, is maybe from the person from physics chemistry nowadays biology can are also coming into the picture with the names and bio means field are very very emerging and very very boosting nowadays so the size of the names actually it is the range of the names this devices we can see it is limited with the one micrometer to one millimeter so this is the range so within this small range you can make a beautiful name sensors type of thing or this type of uh, keep me on chip or lab on chip devices where this can mimic our entire body functions in a beautiful way. The three main parameters are there inside the mains. Uh, one has to be the input. Input is nothing but the sensors. Then the decision making part that consists of the microelectronic ICs and there will be one output that is actuators. So what sensors will do, the sensors will do the gather it can gather the information by measuring mechanical thermal biological chemical magnetic and optical signals from the environment so any kind of signal can be sensed nowadays the job of the sensors to collect that information from the environment the microelectronic ic what because uh, not only sensing the information is the sufficient because after sensing the information you have to process it then the microelectronics actually this uh, this uh, ICs will or these integrated uh, the, uh, the uh, electronics so the, the components uh, will do this kind of job so it is uh, act as a decision making piece of the system by processing the information given by the sensors now suppose if you sensor sends the signal and after sensing you process but what is the ultimate okay but you have to do some work so now the actuators come into the play so the finally the actuators will help the system respond by something moving, pumping, filtering or somehow controlling the surrounding environment to achieve it. So if we integrate these three attributes okay, in a proper way uh, inside in a single substrate or single package, then this device will be called the means device where sensing, processing and actuation, all these three will be there. With the help of this technology, we can actually do something different uh, for our healthcare application and the biomedical or biomains applications. So generally, where do we find the means? We can find means in computer printers, automobiles, uh, the projectors, then cell phones, uh, lab on chip devices, optical devices, and lots of other things because main sensors are coming uh, day by day, it is increasing, and the uh, investment in billions also. Uh, we can see uh, in the day by day because everywhere if you talk about the smart city smart system smart room uh, the smart government or uh, digital government uh, and digital uh, you can say the uh, the uh, smart agriculture uh, the uh, say iot internet of things so everything actually the basic element is the sensor so sensor is uh, the coming up with this technology that is the means microelectric mechanical systems now the question is why go micro what are the reason for going the micro because macro type of things are already existing long back so why should we move to the micro because there are certain advantages if we go to move to the micro size devices the smaller devices require less material to make so obviously uh, it is a good because earth has limited resources the smaller devices requires less energy to run uh, because uh, if we have a big amount of devices, big size devices, then the power requirement is also more. But if you have a small devices, then power requirement is small. Redundancy also can lead to the increased safety because uh, in case of one or two, you can use three, four, five, six. Because in space application, the redundancy is a great thing because in space, some sensors are stop functioning. Then it is uh, not possible to go and repair the sensors. And throw it back no so that's why you have to take the precautions uh, in the ground stations so whenever you will 
uh, develop the product okay then you can increase the number of sensors for a same function so that even in one sensors can stop the functioning the other sensor sensors can take over so the redundancy is one of the important issue the micro devices are also inexpensive because it supports the batch fabrication process like our integrated chip because nowadays we can see the cost of the chip is very very less because it supports the batch fabrication that means in a given amount of time lot of sensor lot of substrates or lot of devices can be fabricated now what are the disadvantages will also be there obviously like uh, the uh, adverse effect on measurement that can be one issue the power dissipation in a small device that can also be one of the issue noise generation the heat generation the waste uh, also so these are the all issues are there also in the news but uh, people are working to to this to uh, uh, they are uh, actually remove this kind of and to address this type of issues so it will be i think removed uh, within a soon uh, very soon so materials for mains so we can see the mains uh, if you compare the mains versus ic in ic actually still now there is a silicon dominant because the substrate is always coming in the silicon then you can grow your device or circuit by layer by layer but in mains the there are so wide applicability and wide variety of the materials so it may be polymers you can use ceramics you can use semiconductors you can use metals we can use composite materials now you can see the variation in substrate category also substrate may be plastic glass substrates like a ceramic substrate maybe also semiconductor in thin film category it may be semiconductor polysilicon dielectric even in metal also there are so many kind of metals can be used even in dielectric or many variety of uh, dielectrics packaging also plastic packaging possible ceramic packaging possible metal packaging possible so so means that they actually it can support the all kind of materials all kind of technology there is no certain design library Uh, like that our ic so uh, according to the demand or according to the structure of the sensors you can choose any other uh, any any suitable method to fabricate and any suitable material that can support from electrical engineering or control system point of view mains can be described like that is a transfer function because in the left hand side we can see there is a pressure sensor tilt sensor microphone these are all in big form in a some kind of big devices but whenever it will you will fit this in the transfer function and then in the right hand side in the output you will get a smaller version of this so mains can be regarded as a nothing but a transfer function where this uh, the, it will enable the miniar uh, miniaturization and lower cost manufacturing of existing products so mains mains can be treated in like that way also what are the manufacturing process the general the design cycle and then after the designing we will go for fabrication then after fabrication we will go for packaging after packaging we should go for testing then the some of the fabrication process are also it is common in silicon fabrication or ic fabrication process that photolithography ion implantation diffusion oxidation cbd sputtering deposition by epitaxy etching that is also common in the mains uh then uh, micro machining techniques is uh, actually uh, the more suitable for the mains type of fabrication so there are two type of micro machining techniques one is the bulk micro machining where bulk of the substrate actually is interrupted suppose you can see some cut out of some edge out some of the bulk of the substrate like that and it will make some angles so in the right hand side you can see the micro mechanical vibrating during gyroscope so this type of structures can be built with the help of this bulk micro machining where bulk of the semiconductor or substrate can be cut out or can be etched similarly on the contrary we can have the surface micro machining process where bulk or silicon substrate will not be interrupted but you can grow your device or sensor by layer by layer something like that without interrupting your silicon substrate so substrate will remain same then another uh, fabrication uh, process is that liga so it is also high, very high aspect ratio micro machining so where we can build some kind of very complex and high precision structures with the help of this liga process now the some one example just i like to mention the how the bulk micro machining happens so for this step suppose if we want to make a diaphragm for a pressure sensor 
then uh, we can have the silicon wafer like that then we will deposit our silicon dioxide layer then after the deposition we will also deposit some of the photoresist layer for our photolithography then we will align the mask kind of that then we will expose uh, to the uv ray through this mask opaque region and then after this so this is the our transparent region and this is the uh, the uh, mask region so when the uv ray passes through that so it will develop like that now now we can see the unexposed photoresist should be removed by the developer like that then again we will also etch this uh, substrate or the sio2 layer the blue band with the some kind of hydrochloric uh, acid solution kind of thing then we have to also remove unexposed resist by that which is called the stripping effect like that then we will also uh, etch this silicon substrate now this is the bulk of the silicon so that's what is called the bulk micromachining so by koe solution and like that so it looks like a kind of uh, grooves or trenches so okay, it can create some of the slopes and angles type of thing so this is called the bulk micromachining in the bulk micromachining we generally see there are two type of etching technique one is the isotropic another is the anisotropic etching in isotropic etching we generally see that the regular etching profile where you can create a regular geometry but in anisotropic etching some not regular because here etching rate is not uniform in vertical direction and the lateral direction from the figure you can see that vertical direction the etching rate is higher but in lateral direction etching rate is smaller so that's why it makes some angles but in isotropic etching here yeah, vertical and lateral the etching rate will be uniform so for regular kind of structure if you want to make then we can take the help of isotropic etching and otherwise then we can also we will take the help of anisotropic etching so anisotropic etches that are some examples figures so this type of structures can be built can be possible with the anisotropic etching some pyramidal structures some grooves trenches okay the the some kind of angles uh, the spokes like of structures that is possible but uh, that is not possible using the isotropic etching Similarly, the surface micro machining I told you it will not disturb the substrate or silicon wafer. So silicon wafer is that we have taken, then we'll deposit some layer. It is called the uh, layer of polymide. Suppose then we'll etch part of the layer like that. Then we'll deposit the structural layer like that. So after that we will remove this green layer. This is called the sacrificial layer because this layer knows that we have to sacrifice. Okay, to make some kind of structure. So that's why after sacrificing this one, the structure looks like so freestanding type of structure. This is called the cantilever. The cantilever in a main so is called the one end is completely free, this end, and this end is completely full, fixed. So one of the best examples we can say diving board of a swimmer. You can make the analogy between these type of structures and the diving board of a swimmer. So it is a, one of the example of a cantilever. The surface micro machining uh, also uh, another example we can see that uh, in our uh, household that uh, our kids are very fond of this type of uh, blocks type of playing of the game so where we can see the green plate actually it is we have as a silicon wafer okay and uh, on the silicon wafer or green block we can make our own higher uh, the uh, own houses, own structures, like other things. So we will not disturb this green plate. On the above of uh, this green plate, you can make your own structure. So this is nothing but a surface micro machining technique. There are nowadays other lot more micro machining techniques, very high precision techniques are there, like selective laser sintering, then fused deposition modeling in 3D printing. We have heard about a lot of that 3D printing technology. Then uh, robot dispensing, stereolithography, inject printing, then two photon polymerization, direct laser writing, so many things. And you can see the minimum feature size also, it is, uh, it is not a constant. So if you select the different, different techniques, and then minimum feature size will also be changing. So if you need a very high, small feature size in micrometer or nanometer level, then obviously you have to think. In kind of different technology normal fabrication and micro machining technique cannot suppose this minimum feature size of the device the application of mains uh, we have already seen that uh, but uh, here i mean to uh, actually uh, 
show you some kind of biomains type of application. Uh, uh, the the biomains will be coming later, but before that, some we can see the defense industry areas, the aerospace, automotive, biotechnology, telecommunication, analytical chemistry, information technology, all where everywhere you can find the application of the names based sensors and actuators. The biological application, that's why because the blast sensor lab on a chip, because nowadays the lab on chip is coming, so everything can be built. All the pathological detection, pathogens, the detection of RNA, DNA, antigen, antibody, virus, bacteria can be possible within a teeny closed chamber, microfluidic chamber. That is called the lab on chip. So entire lab actually can be mimicked. The function of the lab can be mimicked inside a small, tiny microfluidic chamber. That is called the lab on chip. Optical means there are other applications like projectors, scanners. Inertial measurements, some kind of accelerometers, gyroscopes, pressure measurements, the map sensors, barometric sensors, radio frequency means uh, the this type of uh, antennas or switches are coming because in radio frequency means also very important for today's market scenario because in coming 5G and 6G scenario, very high switching device you require in there, RF means will support. Then there are a lot of other technological applications also of our means. But uh, there are some actuation principles. There are basically four categories of actuation principles in our means. That electrostatic, you can see it is a very simple technique based on the parallel plate capacitors, simple low power and fast response. Then it is piezo-resistive actuation technique the, due to the change in resistance with strain. Um, uh, the, uh, this phenomena, this physical uh, phenomena, you can implement it into a design and then you can make a sensor with this type of phenomena uh, thing. The thermal also, thermal actuator also, it works on the, based on the principle of changes in temperature profile. So if you make a changes in temperature in the two end of a uh, suppose conductor, then we can see there is a generation of the voltage or current. So from temperature to current, you can generate. The thermal actuator. Then piezoelectric also is very very popular. The change in electric polarization with stress. Suppose if we apply the stress on piezoelectric material, then you can generate the voltage. And that's why the energy harvesting without the need of separate power supply, the piezoelectric energy harvester is been very very popular because you did not to attach any uh, power supply to actuate this one because it itself can actuate with some kind of vibration, some other kind of sources. So it can exhibit some kind of displacement and after the displacement, then it will generate some kind of voltages. Medical applications, the measurement of physical and chemical parameters of blood, temperature, pressure, pH level, then uh, consumer electronics, environmental application, determination of concentration of substances in, in, in our environment, food industry, contaminants and impurities, Process industry, robotics, that is to measure the distance, acceleration, force, pressure, and temperature, everywhere the means can be found. Now, this is the biomains. This is directly related to this topic. The biomains is a very, very popular terminology nowadays in this names area because, because the biology and the names have a good uh, matching okay, between each other. I will show you the next slide. Well, what is that matching? Why the biomains actually are coming? Very, very interesting field for the research. Biomains generally include the three major areas are the biosensors for identification and measurement, then bio instruments and surgical tools. The now, now the doctors are using this type of highly precision surgical tools for in their operation theater. Then bioanalytical systems for testing and diagnosis. Major technical issues for biomedical product are functionality for the intended biomedical operation adapted to existing instruments and equipment. Obviously, this is a new technology, so people will it will take some time to adapt it. Compatibility with biological systems of the patients, obviously, because when you are dealing with the patients, you have to be very, very cautious. What type of biological substances and systems, what will be the material that should not react with your body? So this type of issues uh, should also uh, we should focus on these issues and we have to take the extra precautions whenever you will be using this biomains product for the healthcare uh, applications.
So now this is the matching actually between biomes because the overlap you can see the overlap between microbiology and the microcytic feature size. In the in our the normally the nucleus, the bacteria, and eukaryotic cells are also lying in the range. Yeah, the hundred micrometer. Basically, the uh, you can see the virus and bacteria. The the um, uh, range actually the length of that, okay, or the diameter of that virus or bacteria maybe in that range, hundred micrometer to ten micrometer to one micrometer. Uh, similarly, viruses also are lying in this some ranges. Some proteins are lying in these ranges. So our mains also the feature sizes are also supporting this type of ranges. Okay, one to hundred micrometer that we have seen. So because they are these two can coincide, coincide with each other because the same size of scale are both are they are in mains and also the biological parameters. So people thought that it can be a good technology or good tool to detect. So this type of viruses or bacteria or pathogens or proteins, and to make use of this technology for the easy and very uh, precision detection. So that's why biomems are very very uh, interesting, and a lot of people are working in this region in this research domain. The biomedical some example of biomedical sensor you can see there's some glucose concentration of it can measure the glucose concentration of the patient. Then um, after that, we can see uh, there is a uh, the, the another thing that is a main cantilever as a biosensor. So but nowadays, uh, this is a lot being uh, used in uh, actually in uh, everywhere. Okay, in the uh, detection of the uh, biological molecules or in detection of the molecules in the air, in molecules in the water or in the human body. Or in high precision agriculture or smart agriculture, also so all these kind of sens sensors can detect these target molecules. So whenever the target molecule comes in close contact with that analyte, okay, and then it will bind. After the binding, it will exert some stress on the cantilever. So due to the stresses, so it will feel some deflection. So whenever it will deflect the cantilever beam, then it will generate some kind of voltage. So then actually uh, if you measure the deflection like that the amount of deflection can be directly corresponding to the amount of target analyte so by the if you measure the deflection then we can have a uh, estimate that how much the molecules are coming and it is uh, tied with our the probe molecule so this kind of techniques can be also implemented to detect some kind of uh, biological particles now, so I have talked about the MEMS. So MEMS is a one part that is technology that can support this lab on chip type of devices. Similarly, with MEMS also, microfluid is also coming into the game because without the microfluid, uh, we cannot make it as a for lab on chip type of application. So why the microfluid is important? Because study of the fluids in microwave, it is called microfluidics. So you can see the microfluidics are directed, mixed, and separated or manipulated to attain the multiplexing, automation, and high throughput system. So, in a small chamber, small uh, volume of fluid, okay, uh, then we can see a lot of behavior of the fluids in a small chamber. So, you need not to have a very, uh, very big size of lab, okay. So, uh, within a small requirement of a lab space, you can. The micro channels network design must be precisely elaborated to achieve the desired feature like lab on chip, detection of pathogens, electrophoresis, DNA analysis, etc. Microfluidic devices exploit the physical and chemical properties of the liquids and gases at a micro scale. So, these microfluidic devices, uh, then with the help of this technology, we can also visualize, we can go into the deeper uh, good insight into these properties of the liquids and gases at the micro and nano scale because the behavior in the macro scale is entirely different with the behavior with the micro scale. So whenever you will dealing with some macro size of equipment or macro uh, behavior of a particle, then the behavior will be different. But if you some uh, uh, enclose some uh, gas particle or liquid particle in a very small micro size chamber, then the motion, the particle dynamics will be different. So that's why microfluidic support. So in microfluidics, you have to study uh, the fluid dynamics and the microfluidics. Then with the help of these microfluidics and names, you can make this type of lab on device. 
So some examples of the microfluidics nowadays that you can see that uh, cell shorting, the focusing, the magnetophoresis, these are possible. Magnetophoresis means the particle movement with the uh, presence of the magnetic uh, field. So uh, like, likewise, also the fluid particle uh, can be also monitored with the help of the our electric field. So electrophoresis is also there. Magnetophoresis is also there because in our uh, fluid uh, sample, in our body, uh, this fluid sample consists of so many ions, so many magnetic ions, also electric ions, also so many parameters. So, uh, with the, if you uh, apply some electric field or magnetic field, then you can see some kind of different behavior in their movement. So, with the help of this behavior, we can do some kind of sorting, some kind of focusing. Uh, so to detect some kind of pathogens and uh, this uh, detection of the DNA, detection of the RNA, some other kind of pathogens can be possible with the help of these techniques. What the microfluidics can do, the, it is very, very simple, uh, small sample is required, very low fluid volume consumption because you need not to liter or gallon type of water okay, or kind of any fluids, uh, you need a very small milliliter type of uh, volume uh, required for, for your editor study. Very fast analysis, it can give you the uh, results in short time, in low response time, compactness of the system, safer platform for chemical, radioactive and the biological studies. <clears throat> the whole biological process integrated and simplified for the end users, high throughput, multiplexed and highly parallel assays. Portable devices for point of care applications, faster analysis due to the shorter reactions and separation time. Because your amount of fluid is very, very less. Okay, so that's why the time is very, very small, but precision also will be very, very high. Accurate measurement, microfluidic allowing to increase the measurement resolution in a given application. So that's why microfluidics is becoming very, very popular. So there are certain uh, also, uh, division of the or category of the microfluidic droplets with microfluidic systems are there where uh, you can uh, the uh, fluid flow in, in the droplet manner. Suppose one drop, two drop. Okay, in some uh, after some time, if you collect the drops and then you can have a you can see the uh, all the fluidic behavior inside a micro channel or the nano channel of the micro chamber. So drop, droplets based microfluidics is also nowadays very, very much. So microfluidics are lying in this uh, domain. They are engineering, biotechnology, it can support physics, chemistry, biochemistry, and others. So like names, the microfluidics also, it can welcome to the, from the different, different branches. So engineering finds the application, physics also find the application, chemistry is also there, biochemistry there, nanotechnology, biotechnology. So, now you can see the similarity between names and microfluidics. Both are very interdisciplinary, both are of high value, both have a wide good potential. So if you mix these two technology, names and microfluidics, then also you can have a better technology together. Some of the typical components of microfluidics, you can uh, see micro ducts, micro level actually, micro nodules, micro pumps, turbines, micro filters, micro needles, mixtures. The micro reactors, micro dispensers, micro separators. The behavior of liquid in the micro domain differs greatly from the macro scale fluid. Just now I told you because whenever you want to measure the behavior in macro domain, so there are a lot of differences. Because in a uh, whenever you restrict the chamber or channel or in micrometer or nanometer level, then you have to think uh, also some kind of extra physics. So there the some idea idea. Uh, ideal and non-ideal effects also are coming into the picture. That was some, uh, likewise, some of the uh, that uh, you can consider some of the uh, this physical phenomena of the physics uh, whenever we are dealing with the micro domain, the behavior of the liquids. like surface tension, very very important. Laminar flow, fast thermal relaxation, diffusion, turbulence. Okay, the turbulence is basically it is the absence of the laminar flow. So viscosity. Uh, this, this type of parameters actually in fluid dynamics, in uh, fluid mechanics is very, very important to study or to deal with this type of microfluidic behavior. 
then uh, physics of microfluidics just uh, uh, i think all of us heard about the nuts and nuts and number it is the ratio of the molecular mean free path length to it. Uh, the our uh, physical length of a cell suppose uh, the molecular mean free path of a particle suppose in kind of millimeter or micrometer range and suppose your dimension of the chamber is millimeter then it is no problem because then you can see there is enough mean free path okay to uh, the particle can collide with each other and the particle dynamics will be uh, just it will be uh, governed by the very simple our well established fluid flow equation like navier stokes equations and other fluid flow equation but whenever suppose if a chamber or uh, channel size is in nanometer level or micrometer level and also your mean free path of the particle fluid particle like your sodium or potassium inside our blood also in the nanometer level then it is very difficult to study to the behavior because they are the the both mean free path and the physical length of this that uh, device that dimension becomes very comparable with each other so it is very very difficult to measure and to study the behavior then we have to take help some kind of molecular study or the the quantum type of effects coming into the picture not the uh, general the navier stokes and other fluid flow governing law cannot be established that way <coughs> So but these are the basic equations for microfluidics. Those people who are working on the microfluidics or mechanical domain, they they are well uh, known to this type of equations. One is the Euler equation. The this is actually tell, tell, uh, that telling that the principle of conservation of momentum theorem that applied to an ideal fluid and the fluid is without the viscosity. So this is the velocity uh, field that is the relationship uh, with the Euler's equations. This is the Navier-Stokes equation. This is also a very, very standard and well-established uh, microfluidic equations for Newton's second law, the fluid motion. So this is the because uh, we have used this type of equations in, in our study. That's why I, I am showing this kind of you know, the very well-established formula and the equations and mathematical relation in the microfluidics domain. Then uh, the laminar flow. Laminar flow actually is the flow were characterized by the parallel lines flowing linearly with little to no mixing here we can see this the laminar flow where the all the fluid particles will move in that way very linearly because in in the below graph in b you can see the fluid flow is not a laminar because here the particles movements are intersecting and crossing with each other so this is not a laminar flow so the laminar flow can be like that so whenever suppose if you have a, a small uh, dimension of a channel or the chamber then we can think of that the fluid flow is the laminar because here all the particles of a fluid are moving in the same direction with kind of same velocity type of thing, without any external effect in pressure driven flow there is another type of flow in microfluidics here we can see the profile of the fluid flow particle like a parabolic in nature so this is called the pressure driven flow it is commonly found in fluid system in microfluidic device at this kind of flow which is pumped through the device by some positive displacement. Suppose if you have a pump in the inlet and you are pumping some fluids, then after pumping in the micro channel, you can see this type of profile of the fluid, and the velocity or the fluid, uh, the, uh, the, the fluid particle will traverse this type of uh, shape. Okay, it will create. So this is the parabolic type of thing. Okay, so this is called the pressure driven wave. Then another is very also important electroosmosis or electroosmotic flow. It is the motion of fluid induced by an applied potential across the porous material, capillary tube, membrane, micro channel, or any other fluid. Suppose if you have applied some of the electric field, and after applying the electric field, if you uh, study the flow of the motion of a suppose uh, the blood, because blood has contained so many uh, elements like our sodium, potassium, carbonate protein, algorithm, many things. Okay, now each and all the characteristics and behavior will be different and their velocity will be different, their nature will be different with the application of this type of electric field. So electroosmosis is the motion of a fluid induced by an applied potential across the porous material. Then we can see this electroosmosis, porous material. Microfluidic devices, micro delivery system, inject printers, glucose sensors, lab on chip, organ on chip, body on chip. This is the one example of the micro delivery systems. So just by 
actually uh, pressing this type of small devices into your skin, it can automatically insert the drug into your skin. Okay, so this is called the micro drug delivery. How the this uh, microfluidics and memes are fighting with the COVID-19 because the uh, in the month of April the, we have heard that in a one US based California based farm they have actually invented this type of technology. It's called real-time RT-PCR with the help of the microfluidics. The main technology brings to major benefits to this uh, this uh, PCR te technique because it is reduced size and microfluidic integration. Microfluidic integration for sample and reagent handling has enabled novel techniques impossible at the macro scale such as digital PCR. So uh, because it is done in the micro level domain, so there are some kind of benefits that they have actually uh, seen. The main scale heaters and reaction chambers have a tiny thermal mass, thereby creating a significantly faster heat cool cycle. Because earlier in uh, the RT-PCR machine was there, but with the big size of machine, it takes a lot of time to detect. But with the help of this type of techniques, they have found a very small amount of time and high precision also in the, uh, the virus load of a patient's body or the patient's swab sample. So this also in that way also means and microfluidics are also contributing a lot to fight the COVID-19 battle. The micro inject printers are also, they are one of the uh, example of the microfluidics in modern day techniques. Glucose sensors, we can see the, so it can sense the glucose level from the skin. So there is some technology. So the small device can be thought of like that. So how it will take the sample from the skin. Okay, the sweat sample, from the sweat sample, it can analyze and it can detect the glucose level. The lab on chips are, uh, that uh, we everybody know, the, uh, the lab on chip devices are very, very emerging. So, in, under this category, there are so many devices. Organ on chip, we can see organ on chip like this. Then also liver on chip. The entire liver can be mimicked with the help of this chip. Okay, then lungs on chip. It is also possible. The entire our lungs function can be also possible to integrate and to make it on a microfluidic chamber. And we can do a lot of study on this, a lot of uh, the drug uh, reaction mechanism also. Uh, into the, uh, with this, uh, this type of technology, then heart of chip, entire heart can be mimicked also, it is possible nowadays. Intestine on chip, that is also possible and the, uh, the uh, many universities okay, are also working and developing this type of devices. Then even multi-organ on chip is also nowadays, this is the technology. So not only single organ, or two, three organ can be developed in a microfluidic environment. So the microfluidic fabrication, so these are some fabrication techniques. Um, okay, so this is more, I think, pertinent to the mechanical domain because uh, they uh, for this microfluidic fabrication, how the microfluidic device can fabricate it. There are three uh, main techniques, hot embossing, inject molding, and the soft lithography. So for kind of soft lithography is polymer. So you can take the help of the polymer. The polymer material, you can make this type of lab on chip devices. The, or another uh, like a polymer device can be thought of as a PDMS. PDMS is a very, very biocompatible material. So that's why most of the people are using their device like the PDMS type of material. 3D printing also nowadays with the help of the 3D printing, you can fabricate any complex type of devices. Any, any complex type of devices in biological organs also we can print with the help of the 3D printing technology. Fabrication of lung on chip is help with the help of the 3D printing. You can see the lung on, lung on chip can be also fabricated. Now the, our special focus on the kidney, kidney on chip because uh, we have just started working on the uh, these functions. Okay, so our main objective actually is to mimic some of the functions of the kidney so that if you mimic the some of the functions of the kidney in mains and simulation environment, then also actually it can help a lot because then by externally, you can see what is the behavior of the uh, kidney uh, whenever if you can vary the temperature, whenever you vary the viscosity level, whenever you vary the pressure level, whenever you apply the fluid steer and other type of effects. So it is not required in the patients on some kind of other third party. So simply you can generate the model in your microfluidic and means with the help of some benchmark simulation tool 
and then you can see the also the different and you can do the different different study <coughs> so kidney on chip uh, that is the kidney on chip devices will help in diagnosing the ckd ckd is the chronic kidney disease in early stages to prevent much damage because uh, whenever you detect if you detect the kidney uh, disease in early stage then obviously it is better so you did not so, so uh, the case the, uh, the infected people will not go to the in stage diseases so we have we can prevent this type of diseases in a early stages kidney on chip is important not only in india but also global as the world is facing a big threat yes we have seen that uh, the entire world is facing a big threat of the kidney failure so the koc nowadays that's why it is very very relevant very very useful so and it can also uh, help uh, to uh, remove this type of disease transplanting with koc is little easier than replacing a new human kidney because total suppose in a kidney transplantation suppose the donor has to donate the kidney then you have to replace that kidney uh, with that but in some of the many of the cases doctors have seen that after replacing the kidney also after one or we are two year the all patients are also feeling some problem because the kidney does not work fully uh, like it was predicted so there is some kind of because biological system is a very complex system okay cannot be predicted uh, fully okay uh, in a uh, a priori manner so uh, that's why in that sense koc may be little easy because it is in the chief form there is no need of the human kidney but if, if you can generate this type of devices and can insert into your body and if it can mimic the whole kidney function then it will be very very easy koc using microfluidics will allow to integrate all the actions performed by the kidney in a small area no pain to the patient and also the cost effective obviously there will be some challenges what are the challenges in this type of study because you have to dealing with the blood because blood has a very complex dynamics because in blood flow uh, we in uh, in the micro environment or nano environment because blood has some uh, molecules so okay, some uh, the uh, the some kind of blood components blood path plasma there are so many things sodium potassium protein albumin okay other things are there their natures are also different so it is very very difficult to study all the particle nature inside the blood or the fluid body fluid in replicating the tubule walls it is very very difficult because tubule walls uh, is very thin type of structure helix type of structures very complex so to fully replicating this type of structures inside our body it is one of the challenge in elasticity of the kidney material selection is very very difficult the material that material should not react to any body function any cells okay otherwise then it will lead to the death of the patients so that's why material selection is very very important what type of material is suitable for the biological type of environment okay, of this our human body generating new material is tough and time consuming may not perform perfect function challenge in implantation May, maybe there are coagulation of blood maybe there is coagulation of blood means it is a very kind of alarming condition if fails loss will be fatal suppose if you give uh, fabricate the koc but you have inserted also transplanted but after some days suppose it fails then it will be loss so loss will be fatal that is patient can die patient will die also and may become a leather then uh, this the mains and microfluidics in an interdisciplinary area where i told you where manipulation of the liquids in micrometer design is possible so now how this will actually happen so uh, now i will talk about on this area where actually we are presently doing it the uh, other organizations are also working a lot so was our is in our country then iit bombay is doing uh, also a lot of research on this university of california san francisco their kidney project is there they are actually developing their trying to develop the kidney on chip for the renal replacement they have done a big work also in harvard medical uh, the institute that uh, the, the, uh, also they are doing a lot of research human organs on chip using microfluidics then some of the industries are also a yeah, key player of this field lp flow mimeters now what we are presently doing actually we are trying to mimic some functions of the human kidney using this uh, mains and microfluidics technology so what is that so this is our flow chart 
the kidney study will pass the you have to study the kidney or you have to know the physiology then fluid mechanics also you have to study and all the theory then microfluid is also is a separate branch the separate thing so you have to also study a lot of microfluidics then designing after study all these things you have to you can be able to design these structures then there is a cool certain uh, part that is bioreactor and is the ultra filter the kidney is responsible for these two main thing then bioreactor and ultra filter what we have done we have done the modeling and simulation and also we have supported our uh, simulation with the help of some kind of mathematical modeling then we have analyzed some of the results that we obtained then the, the kidney uh, we can see there is a uh, these two main function ultra filtration and the bioreaction under the ultra filter it is the responsible parts are glomerulus then under the glomerulus it is responsible some kind of dependent absorption because in the kidney we can see the kidney is also kind of uh, reabsorption is also there that means the blood vessel that is surrounded by your uh, your proximal convoluted tubule they some of the that uh, proteins and other parameters will be reabsorbed with your blood okay so that kind of some kind of uh, we have seen the kind of uh, interaction between your blood vessels and the proximal convoluted tubule it is there so this they call this reabsorption so we generally, generally actually want to mimic this kind of reabsorption how the reabsorption is done and how it can be mimicked in the simulation environment that we have tried so for this we have study the fluid stress uh, based uh, mimicking so the fluid stress stress that we have applied inside the our uh, the chamber and then we have seen the how the fluid stress stress actually affects our, our uh, this type of parameters what is very important for the uh, this kidney uh, type of diseases uh, like so this is the flow in the cells we can see when the shear stress are not available like that and when the fluid shear is if you can apply so the structures will be then under flow of the lumen fluid it will our cells will be like that so with the help with the presence of the fluid flow uh, sorry the fluid shear stress so now we have built this kind of structures to just to see how the mimicking the fluid shear stress is going on type of thing then we have seen some of the results that we have got the pressure also we have seen the pressure differences Uh, the different different wings okay of uh, in this chamber so uh, then then also we have seen that uh, how the fluid velocity and pressure distribution actually is depending uh, is changing with the small size structure so uh, the pressure will be around 30 pascal more than the actual liter so we have found so if we apply the fluid shear stress then the pressure will be getting as a higher so this paper actually was published in some journal in 2019 that our then also we have seen the temperature variations also so after the temperature variations we can see this type of thing how the pressure changes with the respect to the variation in temperature from absolute to body because absolute temperature then our environmental temperature room temperature and body temperature these are all different different temperature suppose those uh, chip if we are made in the room temperature the same chip or same type of sensors cannot be fully working uh cannot work in the body temperature the body temperature is different so you have to model oh, the change in the temperature yes yeah just uh, how many more minutes please yeah i uh, 5 minutes 5 minutes uh, okay 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 5 okay. minutes so uh, this temperature behavior actually very important to study and then we have seen how the how the pressure level varies with the help of the temperatures again we have seen the nacl concentration change in the cell site when the reaction takes place the concentration of sodium and chloride is being increased because na sodium and chlorine is a very important constituent in our blood just we have taken for this two constituent and we want to see how the reaction takes place and what is the reaction the dynamics uh, with the time so the proposed structure for kidney and chip provides the appropriate levels of pressure that as present in kidney tubules we have seen that various structural changes have been applied and finally optimized it to provide 0.1 pascal of pressure because we have seen in the after study that the, in the uh, pressure that is applied at the cell site it is 0.1 approximately 0.1 pascal the temperature effect is also considered 
the reaction of cells with incoming water lumen fluid is also modeled and also the obviously the ever growing requirement for kidney on chip devices poses a more challenges on the existing techniques so after that we move on to the some uh, another work a work uh, where uh, just i want to mimic this kind of size dependent reabsorption function in the nephron primarily a glomerulus is responsible for filtration and proximal tubule will diversify the solutes depending on size shape and charge and fluid so if we can mimic this type of thing also then we can also uh, then uh, go to the deep inside of the study how the reabsorption will be done what are the effects of the different parameters on the reabsorption generally in our human the reabsorption is at the 60% so generally it is very common for a healthy man the 60% reabsorption of the solutes is being done so uh, then uh, then we have uh, started our work and we uh, we have created some of the designs uh, for the micro channels and uh, and blood vessels of your uh, lab develop like that and sodium calcium potassium the size that we also know according from the study from the literature that we have got this type of sizes are there now we have on uh, this type of devices because here exactly we are not really uh, mimicking the helix structure but we have made it as a rectangular with a simple structure and we wanted to see the uh, with the help of the simple structure also this device can mimic this type of reabsorption function or not and then we have seen okay so it, it can be possible also from the uh, it can also support the reabsorption functions so the, this work was published in very recently in 2020 in artificial uh, sorry in uh, applied this and applied sciences in Microsoft then after that also we have also done some uh, study between shear stress and the pressure uh, difference then also we have changed the proximal tubule that geometry now we have taken some kind of diagonal shape some kind of uh, serpentine kind of shape and and we have seen there is a the change in flow velocity to the length scale and then also we have seen the pressure and velocity is higher than in the diagonal channel than in the uh, rectangular channel also so the channel length you can see the straight channel the total flow and the diagonal channel the total flow is coming much higher than the rectangular so if the flow is higher velocity will be higher so the reabsorption rate will be the higher so this is our the findings that uh, straight channel diagonal channel straight channel serpentine channel you can see that almost we have got this 43% here, 52% reabsorption in diagonal channel and very small in other two channels. So this work was published in the 2020 in uh, also in the same journal. This is the same uh, the work, uh, the same journal that is the same applied sciences. Now also we have done some kind of also optimized our structures to get the better behavior and the better per performance. And we have done some modeling with the help of molecular not the molecular but the, uh, the normal continuum fluid mechanics principle we have applied and then also we have estimated how many number of channels are required to make the proper reabsorption so there are also this type of works we have seen that uh, the uh, thousands of channels uh, micro and nano channels will be required for mimicking the entire reabsorption techniques so this work is published very recently in artificial organ journal in wild then so this is the summary we can see that uh, the straight channel versus slant channel the average percentage of the reabsorption with the help of the channel width if we vary the channel width also then also it can have a severe effect on this <clears throat> and also uh, we have uh, applied some hydrostatic pressure because hydrostatic pressure in a fluid is very common inside our body also because there is a fluid movement so there will be hydrostatic pressure so if we also mimic this hydrostatic pressure into the simulation environment then what can be the results how the results are input we also we have seen also by we have uh, intentionally put some obstacles here and we want to make the study like that and with the help of some analytical and mathematical uh, the modeling techniques so we have seen that also there is a some kind of uh, the straight uh, structure is having very less outflow rate because of less room for lumen fluid to pass through. So this paper actually was published in 2019 in Springer Microsystem Technologies. Then the summary you can see the uh, the uh, 
the simulation results of presented design have produced an outflow velocity of 9.12 to 10 to minus 5, which is greater than 8.2 to 10 to minus 5 millimeter uh, meter per second without the hydrostatic effect. So if we apply the hydrostatic effect, then outflow velocity is also gaining. So this is good. So it will also enhance the reabsorption rate from 50 to 55 percent, which is desired. So these are the some parties that we have uh, applied in our study. The red lines and the blacks are also there, but we have not applied till now. We will be applying these other physics into our study to make it more compact design. These are the some uh, Indian scenario where the IIT Bombay is doing microchip for blood separation. Uh, then the kidney project, where, what I told you in the University of California, they have made that like coffee cup kind of you know, the KOC devices, okay, like that. So this is the Dr. Subora, technical director. He's working a lot with the help of the Dr. William, he's a medical director. So both of these, they are designing this, the, they're developing the kidney project and they have done a lot of things on this domain. So this is uh, their device, it will look like this. The future work obviously will include um, more physics and more uh, the uh, electrophoresis, dielectrophoresis will apply and then we'll see how this will affect the behavior of the fluid and absorption, reabsorption, the filtration, all, all kinds of behavior, kinetics of the fluid. fluid. These are the, some publications of our work on this field. This is the acknowledgement that uh, for our, with this, uh, for this work we have also uh, hence, uh, the shake our hands with this type of uh, academics, the researchers and medical doctors in our country. These are the international research collaborations in my work of domain, not only in kidney but in other means area also. We are working together. And this is my research students that are presently working uh, in this means and VLSI field. Then, actually, this is the National Main Design Center in, the, in our NIT Silchar, in, and it is located in. Our department, electronics department, and the main motto is that to promote the main field and interdisciplinary research in nature in the academic community. So we are uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the expecting some of the also students will be joining in our this uh, motto and will solve the purpose. These are my fields of study. So the students who are interested, they can come and join to my team. That we are working on RF mains, mains microfluidics. Biomems, Mems Energy Harvesting, VLSI also, we are working on this field. Thank you. So now this is all about my talk. Okay, thanks, uh, Koshik. Uh, I will quickly share some of the questions that have come. Uh, and uh, if you can uh, quickly answer a few of them. Yes. Yeah. So these are some of the questions. I hope you can see my screen now. No, where? It is in chat box. No, can you see my screen? No, I no, have no. So you stop your sharing. Okay, just a minute. I will share. I, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Can yeah, you yeah. see my screen? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So these are some of the questions. If quickly you can take one or two questions. Yes, yes. That the uh, UTI is a urinary tract. Uh, that infection is a major problem nowadays. Yes, it is of course a, is a precursor of the kidney disease. Whenever you are feeling this type of problem, then you should consult your doctor imme immediately. This is a, one of the early symptoms of the kidney diseases because if the urine uh, is a form of the waste product. Then, to which percentage the microenvironment of mice in, mice mimics the immune? The, this is the actually uh, the percentage wise that I cannot tell you correctly what is the percentage, but this process is not a very good procedure and not very effective that's why people are moving toward the kidney on chip type of devices what are the initial symptoms of non-functional kidney like that suppose whenever you will feel some of the uti whenever you have some kind of feel uh, like a, uh, uh, that uh, you are being dehydrated okay then some kind of uh, patches under your eyes so this type of can be the early symptom for, for your chronic kidney disease and you should consult with your doctor immediately. Can pacemaker type devices be also designed? Yes, the MEMS kind pacemaker can also be uh, possible and it is also there in the market presently. 
what is the purpose of blower a blower in the laminar just i could not get this one the blower means of the laminar okay so i will okay. talk i will answer all the question later on if they are interested okay. they can send okay. me me yeah, yeah. so uh, um, uh, Uh, Dr. Koshik, uh, thank you very much uh, for your nice lecture. Because we can see the feedback, you cannot see because we are on YouTube live, and uh, we can yes. see that the um, uh, feedback that we are receiving is uh, really amazing, very fantastic. People have gained an insight from this lecture, and we are proud that in an IT center we are having such type of research group who are working towards such cutting edge uh, technologies to be developed. so thank you very much uh, koshik thanks from the organizer side and on behalf of thank you, thank you thank you also uh, we extend our gratitude and uh, thanks to you so thank you thank you, thank you thank you thank you <clears throat> thank you sir thank you thank you madam so over to risha now uh, i think yes. professor ganti murthy has already joined so risha you can just uh, continue with your uh, yes sir thank you after conclusion of session 8 i welcome you to session 9 of bar 2020 this session will be headed by well regarded and honored professor i welcome you sir professor ganti s murthy a brief bio about professor ganti s murthy he is a professor in biosciences and biomedical engineering at iit indore previously he was a tenured professor in biological and ecological engineering department of oregon state university professor murthy has obtained his btech in agricultural engineering from marist mtech from iit kharagpur and phd from university of illinois usa murthy's group broadly focuses on developing sustainable solutions for a resource constrained world sustainable solutions are technically feasible economically viable resource sustainable environmentally cautious and socially acceptable dr mukti's research is bioprocessing and engineered systems analysis his group employs a combination of experimental and theoretical approaches to conduct multi scale and system level analysis they study the nutrient energy water nexus with a particular focus on building the resilience of agro economical system to pulse and pressure disturbances sir i would now kindly request you to proceed towards the session thank you so much dr mal and thank you so much uh, dr uh, rajiv dey for inviting me for this uh, presentation and uh, good morning everyone and i am audible to you all Yes, sir. Excellent. So uh, I will start uh, with uh, basically my presentation now. I think so. Is my presentation visible? Yes, sir. It is visible. Excellent. So good morning, everyone. So my name is Ganti Murthy. I'm a here uh, professor at uh, IIT Indore in biosciences and biomedical engineering. I'm basically an ag engineer with a focus on eco ecological systems and systems analysis for sustainability. So this is a project that we did uh, about a decade ago, and uh, this the reason I chose this example of. dynamic controller for simultaneous acarification and fermentation process application to fuel ethanol production as the topic for today is this is a uh, this was a very uh, interdisciplinary project which actually went all the way from conceptualizing conceptualization in the lab and uh, development of systems in the lab to actually industrial scale up patenting and licensing so this is a nice example of how uh, a technology can be developed in the lab thought about in the lab developed in the lab and then finally deployed in the field and um, so that is essentially why i chose this topic so instead of so i will be focusing very narrowly on this topic but you will see that this requires quite a number of discipline interdisciplinary knowledge as you see and another reason for selecting this uh, problem or this uh, talk or this topic for this talk is that this topic also illustrates how in this modern world now the traditional disciplinary boundaries of let's say i'm an electrical engineer i'm a mechanical engineer or i'm ag engineer or i'm civil engineer or even i'm a biologist all those things break down 
we have to start from uh, basically we have to develop these kind of problem centric approaches where we bring in multiple uh, disciplinary multidisciplinary teams to solve the problem uh, this thing so essentially we should be problem centric rather than discipline centric and this is a very nice example of that uh, kind of an approach so i'd like to uh, basically uh, uh, spend some time with you all today morning discussing this thing and before I do that, I would like to uh, uh, shamelessly plug in for my uh, lab. Essentially, uh, we call ourselves a sustainable technologies lab. And as uh, Dr. Mal was mentioning, we basically focus on technologies for sustainable bioprocessing and systems analysis for sustainability and resilience. So essentially, we look at uh, any process or a product and ask this question, is this approach technically feasible, economically viable, resource sustainable and is it environmentally conscious compared to the other alternatives if it is not so how can we make it so and our core research areas are essentially in the bioprocess development and scale up and we do a lot of biological and bioprocess modeling control and multi criteria optimization we use many tools such as techno-economic analysis and life cycle assessment and resource assessment to conduct systems analysis all the way from farm to ecosystem scale and then we also study the resilience and sustainability at the nexus of nutrient energy water and land uh, i had established this lab at oregon state university in 2007 and uh, some of the things that we have done there uh, are uh, basically you can see on our, your right so these are some of our research con contributions we have commercialized two technologies one is advanced scale-free fermentation controller which is what i'm going to talk about today and then we also commercialized a, a new technology for on-site landfill leachate treatment and then there have been some pilot scale realizations of technologies essentially things that have moved from bench top to pilot scale and uh, if we have time, I'll talk about that. So this is, uh, again, a technology that is very relevant for uh, our country. So this is about a novel mixed algal bacterial cultures for treatment of domestic wastewater. This also is interesting. Uh, I assume that many of you are electrical engineers. So this is why this would be interesting to you is this again shows you how you can use control systems in non-traditional applications. And then uh, Another technology we worked on was high solid uh, hydrolysis and fermentation reactors. And some of the research that we had done that has actually influenced industry practice is that we established that aflatoxin B1 does not affect dry grind ethanol process. What this has resulted in is that earlier there used to be somewhere around 10,000 tons of corn that used to be treated as a toxic waste. Now that is actually processed and used every year instead of being dumped into landfills. And then we developed some strategies to overcome stack fermentations in uh, modified dry grain processes, which again have resulted in tremendous uh, usage. And uh, these technologies uh, uh, have been are used in use in more than 150 uh, ethanol plants in the U.S. And uh, the technology that I'm going to talk about is actually in uh, basically deployed in more than a dozen plants in the U.S. So. So with that, uh, and then again, uh, just to tell you uh, that we do a lot of multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary system, multi-scale systems analysis. So we start all the way from molecules and cells, go all the way to the laboratory scale, pilot scale, and then uh, to the industry. So all the stuff that you see there are actually products from our group research from our group. So all of these things. So we do enzyme modeling, we do uh, basically uh, study the cells at uh, uh, cellular level, we do some systems biology modeling, uh, laboratory scale studies, a lot of control systems, uh, pilot scale uh, demonstrations, industry scale demonstrations and things like that. For that we use a lot of experiments, process design, prototype construction, process modeling, control theory, systems biology, techno-economic and life cycle analysis. Again, this is for my uh, young colleagues here. This is trying to show you how we need to be thinking beyond our disciplinary boundaries. And one of the key things that we need to develop there is to, if we want to do that uh, transdisciplinary research, is to develop vocabulary so that if I'm an engineer, I can go, I should be able to go and speak to a biologist in their language. And I should be able to go and talk to an economist in their language. 
And similarly, I should be able to talk to any other uh, engineer uh, that I interface with, I work with in their language so that they understand my problem much better. And then I can act like a bridge and then we collaborate in a very uh, nice way. So that is one of the fundamental things that uh, we should all be thinking about. So that is uh, there. And then we are looking for uh, tons of uh, students. I just started the lab here in uh, uh, basically December of last year. So essentially it's been six months out of which Unfortunately, uh, Chinese virus has taken out like six or five months of it out of the seven months. So I'm still looking to build my lab here. And I'll be looking to uh, see any of you if you're interested to pursue master's projects or uh, do PhD or uh, your BTEC projects as well. With that, without much further ado, I will move on into uh, this uh, uh, the actual topic that is developing advanced process control in drive line product plants. So essentially, uh, many of you may not be familiar with dry grind corn process. This is the process which is used in US to produce about 15 billion gallons or 60 billion liters of ethanol from corn every year. What does corn have? Corn has about 70% starch in it. Starch is a polymer of glucose. So essentially it is made of multiple units of glucose. So now what we do is we take that corn take that starch in the corn and then break it down into glucose. That glucose is essentially fermented by uh, the yeast to make convert that into ethanol. And that ethanol is recovered um, and then further process to basically make fuel ethanol and used as uh, additive in the petroleum fuels, uh, petrol and in the petrol. So for example, in India, we have a mandate to add, I think 5% uh, ethanol. And in India, we produce it mostly from sugarcane molasses. Whereas in uh, Brazil, they produce it directly from sugarcane. And in US, it is almost entirely from <coughs> corn ethanol. Corn is basically the makai or uh, maize that we use. So the way that this process works is that the corn comes in from uh, in trucks and railroad cars, rail cars basically, uh, rail wagons to the plant and from the fields. And it is stored on the plant site where after some time, it is taken and uh, ground up, made into a uh, corn flour uh, through a size reduction process in a hammer mill. And once that goes through, a, then it goes to a slurry tank where it is mixed with water and process fluids to make a slurry. And then it is sent through a jet cooker, which is uh, where steam is, is directly injected into this uh, jet cooker. And that causes a lot of shear and essentially gelatinizes starch. And then it goes into a liquefaction tank where we add enzymes, which uh, one of the enzymes is called alpha amylase. That is the enzyme we add there. That enzyme takes the starch molecule, which is like a long chain of uh, uh, polymers of glucose. And then that is broken down into small uh, pieces, essentially. So if you think of that process there, it is essentially, imagine a big pile of noodles, right? And then you are taking a, or a fish net, for example, and you take a pair of scissors and you're just cutting it randomly into small pieces. That is what essentially is happening in that liquefaction process. The scissors is your enzyme and that pile of noodles represents the starch that is already gelatinized. And after that process takes about uh, 90 minutes and uh, typically it happens between 90 to 100 degrees Celsius. After that, the mash, it's called liquid mash. After that, it's cooled. And uh, then we adjust the pH. And then we add another enzyme, which is called glucoamylase. So that glucoamylase is basically will take those small pieces of noodles or the starch pieces, which are called oligosaccharides or dextrins, and then breaks it down into individual glucose molecules. So then we also add yeast along with it, which will consume that yeast, uh, glucose, and then convert that into ethanol. So at the end of this process, uh, which again typically happens at 30 degrees Celsius for about 48 hours, uh, we are left with a liquid that is primarily uh, has uh, ethanol in it. It has leftover components of proteins and uh, oil and all the uh, remaining residual sugars in it. So that is called beer. And that beer goes into a distillation system where the uh, ethanol is separated into about 190 proof or 95% ethanol. And that goes through molecular sieves to produce anhydrous ethanol or 200 proof ethanol. That is, there is no water because we don't want water in our engines. So it has to be removed. All traces of water have to be removed. And then it is put into ethanol storage. Now, what happens to the rest of the stuff? 
After we have removed ethanol, the whole thing is called whole storage, what is left over. Then it is processed in a centrifuge to separate the wet grains and thin stillage, and there is an evaporator. All that thing happens. Essentially, we dry that stuff. And we get uh, in a rotary drive, and we get what is called as DDGS, distillers dried grains with solubles, which is primarily used as cattle feed for ruminants. So ruminants are uh, like cows, buffaloes, those kind of things. So it is used primarily as cattle feed. And because uh, it has a lot of fiber content in it. So this is essentially the whole process of how this uh, thing happens. So now here, this saccharification and fermentation process is one of the very key processes there, if you don't do that process, if that process is not operated efficiently, even a 0.5% difference in the ethanol concentration can mean about $400,000 in profits for a plant. And that is a huge amount of money for a plant that is operating in the margins of about two three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 every year. So, until now, this process of saccharification and fermentation was not really controlled effectively. So it was basically people used to have some set point controllers where you would set the set point of uh, temperature and pH, and, uh, not even pH, just a set point temperature in the saccharification and fermentation process and leave it there. And uh, people would complain about how they're not making profits, how the ethanol yields are variable, which of course will be variable because when you get different types of corn, they have different types of starch in it. And that re results in slightly different liquefaction process, saccharification process, so it yields slightly different glucose. And also when you have yeast and then these tanks, the fermentation SSF tanks, they're huge. They're like four-story buildings. And uh, each of them is about a million liters. And when you have those things sitting outside, uh, there are all kinds of temperature variations because of the weather. And of course, they're insulated. But still, there are some all these variations that take place. So because of that, uh, there is variations in the ethanol. And as I was mentioning earlier, even 0.5% difference. Normally, you get about 14 to 16% ethanol concentrations, volume by volume. So even if you have 0.5% deviation over a long term, that actually means huge amounts of profits uh, that are lost for the plant. And uh, so that is where we wanted to focus our issue, uh, our uh, study on, because everything, the rest of the processes are pretty standard cut and dry. And this is the only process where we have enzymes, we have yeast, which is a biological organism, and that is where the process control is extremely difficult. Whereas in all the other processes, the, because they are abiotic processes, you are just heating, cooling, those kind of things. The traditional control systems that we have are pretty sufficient and pretty good. They really work well. So. If you look at a dry grind corn process, all of these processes are very, very well managed, except the saccharification and fermentation process, which is basically uses very rudimentary control systems. So that is where we wanted to focus our uh, attention on. So we wanted to design a dynamic controller to achieve optimal fermentation performance under varying process conditions in dry grind corn ethanol production process. So this was our overall objective for this project. Now. As, a, as we just saw, uh, if I have to simplify that cartoon to something that all engineers understand, this is how it looks like. So we get dry corn, ground corn, mix it with water and uh, process water, and uh, we get about 25% solids. This is how a starch molecule looks like. Uh, and then during the liquefaction process, we break it down into textrins, where just the pH, cool uh, the temperature from 90 to 30 degrees Celsius, and then add yeast. And then that yeast will take the sugars and convert it into ethanol. And uh, that ethanol is recovered and then further processed, uh, basically whatever that whole stage is further processed to make DDG. So this is the entire process. So now if I want to control the saccharification and fermentation process, you would all know that I need to know what is coming in, right? As control uh, systems uh, people, you will all know that I need to know what are the inputs to my process to control it properly. And I need to know the system state. So for that, it is important to know what comes into this process. So if what comes into saccharification or fermentation process is this dextrin mash. And that one is essentially a product of this liquefaction process. So the liquefaction process. So the liquefaction process, again, 
Uh, so is essentially has inputs in terms of the starch and which are essentially biological materials that become state as initial conditions. So the liquefaction process is a process that is happening in the uh, plant and is variable. So therefore, we'll have to model that process as well. So if we want to control saccharification fermentation process, our first step would be to understand what happens in the liquefaction process and to what extent it proceeds. Therefore, we wanted to model that liquefaction process. As you see, the, we have to start again with the starch molecule and we end up with the dextrins. That is what happens in the liquefaction process. So then what we did was we looked into what is the structure of amylopectin. So there are uh, starch has two polymers, amylose and amylopectin. Amylose is pretty much like a straight chain, whereas amylopectin, on the other hand, is like a branch structure of glucose molecules. So each of those blue dots that you see are actually individual glucose molecules. And then, uh, so you have like a tree structure. So there are different nomenclatures there. They're called A chain, B1, B2, B3, C chain, and things like that. So that is not really necessary for you all to understand, but understand that we have a very branched structure. And we have to uh, think of a way to actually simulate the structure. So that there are many models that are available, um, uh, kinetic models, that are basically like a first order differential equation that will model this process. And uh, but the problem again with those things is that when we actually want to understand what is the kind of dextrins, none of the models work well. Therefore, we had to develop our own model. So we started off with the amylopectin structure. Then we basically modeled different molecules. So all you see here, all these different structures that you see are different simulated amylopectin molecules. So this is how a amylopectin molecule will look like if you spread it on paper. It's actually a three-dimensional structure, but if you spread it on paper, this is how it looks like. But then we wanted to make sure that this is statistically similar to the actual amylopectin molecules that occur in nature. Therefore, we actually saw we uh, saw what is the distribution of different types of chains. Remember, I was talking about that uh, A, A, B1, B2, B3, and C chains. That is essentially the chain length of DP. So, uh, degree of polymerization or DP. So, we modeled that. Uh, the blue line represents the what was modeled, and then uh, the dotted line represents what was actually measured. So, between these two, it is a very, uh, very stand. I mean, it, it, it actually shows that the molecules that we have modeled are actually similar to the distributions that occur in the nature. So we were confident with the first step that, yes, we could model the starch molecular structure. Now, now when we model the starch molecular structure, the amylose, remember uh, how I was describing that uh, uh, action of alpha amylase? I said, we have a pile of noodles or imagine a pile of fishing net and then you have a pair of scissors and you're randomly cutting it. So that exactly is what we try to simulate here. So we said, okay, our uh, enzyme is acting in pseudo randomly in different random sites, essentially in the molecule. Therefore, we model, uh, basically using Monte Carlo simulation, we model the possible sites of enzyme action those are represented by the red dots that you see there. And at each instant, enzyme is acting in all these places and hydrolyzing. So essentially, it is similar to your cutting of this chain. And uh, it happens over a long time. And when you simulate this multiple times, what you end up is a mix of small chains, all in software, of course, that simulates the exact distribution of the uh, de uh, dextrins that occur after liquefaction process. And now you can see how we have used a biological uh, molecule, uh, the star amylopectin. We have tried to model that. And then we have used our understanding of how the enzyme acts in a kind of a superficial way, I would say. This is kind of at the molecular level. We have used that to model how the uh, the process occurs in the liquefaction step using Monte Carlo simulation. And then, so essentially our liquefaction model was essentially complete at this point. So the inputs were, we take the starch content, the amylose, the linear chain and amylopectin ratios, the enzyme dosage, because we need to know how much enzyme is there. And we also need to know what is the enzyme activity, how fast or how slow the enzyme can act. Because in industry, they use many types of enzymes and uh, from different sources like bacterial, fungal sources, and each of them have different 
the activity and they also have uh, different uh, responses to the temperature and pH. So we need, also need the temperature and pH of the liquefaction tank. Remember, this is a simple process with an enzyme reaction. So we are not really worried about how we can control. So we are not worried about controlling this process because we know that this is actually done very well, as I was explaining earlier. So these are the inputs to our liquefaction model. And what we get out is the mash composition after the liquefaction, which will have all these small chains of these glucose uh, dextrins, small chains of the glucose molecules. Then once we do that, then we wanted to do a saccharification model. We did a similar model with that, uh, again using the mash composition after liquefaction as the input. Enzyme dosage. This time, this enzyme is called glucoamylase, which will break those small chains into individual glucose molecules. And the enzyme activity, again, this is the reason why we need to specify that, is because different types of enzymes from different biological organisms will have different types of activity at a given temperature and pH. So, temperature and pH of the fermenter. So, what we get out of this one is the production rates of glucose, which is a single sugar, maltose, which is a, a two. The glucose molecules joined together will form maltose. Maltotriose is essentially three glucose molecules joining together is maltotriose. So we get those things. And then uh, now we have yeast that is consuming that uh, essentially glucose and converting it into ferment, uh, fermenting it into ethanol. Now, if I have to take a biochemical view of yeast, so if I have to list all the reactions that are happening in the yeast, so this is something uh, it looks like. There are 22 more pages of this. So typical yeast model uh, from a genome scale uh, model will have something around 1,200 to 1,500 reactions. And uh, writing all of that, getting kinetic parameters for all that is not really a uh, easy task. But then how do we engineers view this as something like this? This is our engineer's model of yeast. Glucose goes in something happens and then we have ethanol coming out and then this uh, cybernetic model uh, but then we wanted to have a happy balance between these two things so for that we went to what we call as the cybernetic model and in the cybernetic model uh, we have in, essentially considers the inputs and the optimal uh, way in which, the, for example, the factories are managed. So in a microeconomic model, where we have raw materials that come into different factories and uh, we have some of the intermediate products that are stored in warehouses and those two are used to make another product in a factory three. So essentially, if you have something like this kind of a system, then the rate at which the factory one operates and the rate at which the factory two operates uh, uh, and uses the raw materials will determine the size of your warehouse one and warehouse two, right? So, or if you have warehouse one and warehouse two, the way that it uh, operates in a modern uh, just-in-time type of uh, uh, manufacturing chain, supply chain, is that if, let's say, the factory three is operating very fast and uh, the warehouse one uh, is depleting, let's say it needs two products from warehouse one and one product from warehouse two to make one uh, final product then the warehouse two will be depleting very fast that means the people in the factory one there will be uh, demand for more products from this uh, factory one so that will speed up and that essentially means more raw materials will be processed so essentially your factory will speed up or slow down depending on the status of the warehouse and there is some kind of a feedback when we incorporate something like this at a cellular level, that is called a cybernetic model. I will not go into the details of these uh, things, but essentially that is a broad concept of a cybernetic model. So it's slightly different from a simple kinetic model. Uh, and there is some, uh, and in fact, people have shown that when a cybernetic model operates, this is very similar to our uh, optimal control. Uh, so uh, 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 LQ controller, essentially. Okay. So this is something like that, uh, basically, uh, when you implement that, this is very similar to that kind of a process. And then we try to model that uh, for yeast. So again, remember that we are not going for those 22 pages of that uh, yeast models. What we are trying to do is very, very simple model, but essentially we are saying, okay, uh, yeast, we know, let's say given that it has all the other nutrients sufficient, uh, have all other nutrients, so it can take glucose, and oxygen, for example, and convert that into energy metabolites through pathway R4, which is your aerobic pathway. And we also know that yeast will actually convert 
the glucose into energy metabolites like, like ATP essentially uh, through an anaerobic pathway which also produces ethanol like R1. R1 here represents the anaerobic pathway and R4 represents aerobic pathway which requires oxygen. Anaerobic pathway R1 does not require oxygen. We also know that the glucose is used to make many of the cellular components through other reactions. So we model that as R2. And we know that new cells are formed by using the ATP, for example, the energy metabolites, the cellular components, all of those things, and then they make the cell mass. And there is some acetic acid and glycerol produced as a byproduct. So these energy metabolites, for example, the cell components are like a warehouses in a previous example. And the factory is represented by R1, R2, R3, R4. So, so now this is our uh, model here, essentially. Uh, X represents the cell mass, G represents the glucose, E represents the ethanol, O represents oxygen, small e, i represents all these R1, R2, R3, R4. So essentially this is our cybernetic model. And the phi, uh, the, basically this alpha, ui, these are all some coefficients that are used in the cybernetic model, which are automatically determined based on the levels of the energy metabolites and the cellular components. So, uh, so yeah. So then we made that uh, cybernetic model and we also then essentially we had our fermentation model will have glucose, ethanol, acetic acid, lactic acid, glycerol, concentration in the fermenter, the yeast dosage, the temperature and pH of the fermenter. So that cybernetic model will output consumption rate of glucose, production rate of ethanol, yeast, cell mass, acetic acid, lactic acid, and glycerol. And then, uh, Basically, this is our uh, simultaneous saccharification. So we put together the fermentation model and the saccharification model that I discussed earlier together to form what we call as simultaneous saccharification fermentation process. So remember, this is the process that happens in that uh, second step which we want to control. This is the process we want to control. So the process inputs for this are yeast dosage, temperature, pH, mash composition after liquefaction, enzyme dosage. This is a glucoamylase enzyme. And then the enzyme activity. And what we get as outputs are the consumption rates of glucose, production rates of ethanol, yeast cell mass, acetic acid, lactic acid, and glycerol. These are the things. So essentially, we are very interested in that ethanol and the production rate of ethanol and consumption rate of glucose. So now you can see how we have taken the model for liquefaction and uh, made another model for scarification fermentation process. So but then one of the things that happens is uh, all these models actually require us to measure the cell mass. Measuring cell mass in a uh, defined media, as we call in biology, uh, is very, very easy. In fact, you can just take that and put it into a spectrophotometer, get an absorption reading at 540 or 640 nanometers, and then you can calibrate that to your uh, dry cell mass. But then when you have what we call as a complex media, when you have corn ethanol process or any process where you have proteins from corn, all these things uh, that are interfering, it is almost impossible to actually measure the cell mass. But then having that cell mass, is a, if we need to know that thing, uh, cell mass, for proper uh, estimation of the saccharification of the fermentation model. So how do we do it? So we use what we call as a very simplified metabolic flux model. So this is again coming from the systems biology part, where this essentially, uh, net, this figure that you see, the uh, network diagram that you see on your left in the slide, is this very, very, very simplified glucolytic cycle of yeast. So essentially this represents the how the glucose is consumed coming from the, the top and then the ethanol is produced and uh, other things are produced like CO2, glycerol, acetate, and biomass, all these things are produced. Now, if you think about it, I can represent each of these reactions. For example, the glucose flux, the Q1 that you see here is something that I can measure uh, because I can measure glucose very easily in a solution. And now there are these anabolism, essentially, which is making of this biomass, that is Q2. This catabolism is using of this glucose for all the other reactions. So that is all this Q3, Q4, Q5, Q6 to Q8. So all these reactions. Now, if I put it together, so in a matrix form, this is how I can form, right? ST into Q. 
So now what happens is ST is your psychometric matrix. ST is this one here. And then Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, this is your flux matrix. Uh, so essentially ST into Q uh, will be zero under steady state, right? So there should be no accumulation of any of these products. Therefore, under steady state, that should be zero. But then of these measurements, I have some parts that are measured, some parts that are unmeasured. So I can decompose this into ST unmeasured, ST into Q for unmeasured, plus ST into Q measured. Then I can actually get an estimate of Q measured, that is the fluxes that are unmeasured, using the measured fluxes like this, right? As you can see, it's just a simple matrix operations. So now you see how you have to use linear operations and all these knowledge to again in conjunction with what happens in the cell to figure out this thing. Otherwise, we'll be uh, left with uh, some states that we don't measure. And uh, that is very important because if you have to do a state estimation, this is very important. So this is essentially like your observer, like a software observer. And then, so this is how the process looks like at this point. So we have had the liquefaction model, which takes in the starch content, amylose, amylopectin ratio, enzyme activity, dosage, temperature, and pH, and gives us the liquefied mash composition, which is fed into the saccharification model, along with the enzyme activity, the glucose uh, amylase enzyme activity, and dosage, temperature, pH. That gives us a mash composition uh, for uh, temperature, pH, and we add that uh, to that the HPLC measure. High uh, pressure liquid chromatography measurements to measure the glucose and things like that. When that is fed into the fermentation model, which is which consists of cybernetic yeast model and then the metabolic flux analysis model that I just showed you uh, to measure get the cell mass, we have the yeast cell model. And then we also have a simplified saccharification model to actually have uh, to build our SSF process model, which gives us the system state information. So this is how we are going to estimate the system state from all the measurements and everything, process conditions. So this is how it fits into the overall process. So we have our physical fermenter system uh, that you see in the second, uh, third box from the top is the physical fermenter system. And we feed, we get the temperature, pH, and uh, HPLC measurements, which are fed into our theoretical model of SSF. This is what this one is, the red box there the red dotted box, SSF process model. From that, we get the system state information, which will be fed to the optimal controller, which will determine the set point values for the temperature, pH, and what should be the glucose dosage profile. That will go to a set point controller, which will be used to activate, uh, to uh, perform the control action in terms of activating the control system, control valves, pumps, and those kind of things. So that the temperature, pH, and the glucose dosage profiles can be maintained in the fermentation system. So this process, as you can see, uh, the dark lines that you see, the continuous lines, are where the physical measurements are taking place. The dotted lines are where the information flow is happening. And then the dotted line with these two dots that you see is where the actual control action in terms of electrical signals uh, switching on a valve, or switching on a pump, those kind of things are happening onto the physical system. So that is how we have basically laid out the system. Now what we have discussed up to now is we have discussed about the theoretical model part. Now we will go into the optical controller part. So when we have that optimal controller, so this is essentially that cybernetic model that I was showing you earlier. Uh, the EM is the enzymatic metabolites, SM is the uh, uh, basically that uh, cellular metabolites, and then GP is the glucose uh, uh, textiles, and then uh, G is the glucose, X is the cell mass, E is your ethanol, which is our most important thing. So e, small E1 to E4 or the smaller in, uh, the enzymes that are there uh, that control R1 to R4, I was referring to earlier. And you can see it is a pretty complicated nonlinear system of equations. And uh, each of these R1, R2 have very uh, complicated expressions for each of these, uh, depending on the states. So this is a nonlinear system. Uh, then we what we wanted to do was basically apply it, uh, some kind of uh, control system uh, control theory and so what we did was we represented the states all these states as x1 to x11 there are 11 states and then all the right hand side of these equations here that you see for the model are called fi uh, 1 to 11 and then the control variables are u1 u2 and u3 which are the temperature pH 
and the glucagonist dosage. Those are our three control variables. The system states are given here, the 11 system states. And then we have the uh, RHS as FI, the function. So in compact way, you can represent it as x dot i is equal to fi. That is essentially our first order, uh, our nonlinear differential equations, first order nonlinear differential equations. Now, the Problem formulation in terms of the control system is that the goal of this optimum control is to maximize X3. What is X3? In our case, X3 is ethanol, ethanol concentration. We need to maximize the ethanol concentration at a given final time because we don't care about what happens to ethanol during the fermentation. What we care about is at the end point when my fermentation is done, I should be getting the maximum ethanol uh, concentration. So that which implies I have converted all my glucose into uh, the state, uh, ethanol. The second point is that we need to minimize the deviation of X2 from a set point. We want to have a set point for uh, glucose. X2 is our glucose. G is glucose. So that is our state. We want to keep it at 20 grams per uh, liter. Why is that 20 grams per liter so important? What happens, is, what it turns out is in a fermentation process, we can have infections from acidic acid bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, which will consume the glucose competitively and then will produce acidic acid and lactic acid. These acids not only consume the substrate because the uh, bacteria have consumed it, but also reduce the pH, which will reduce the effectiveness of our yeast. So we do not want the yeast to be impacted. So therefore, we would like to keep the uh, bacteria low, a number of bacteria low. The current solution that was being used is basically to dump a ton of antibiotics into the fermenters so that these antibiotics will be there and they will keep the bacteria down and the yeast can grow. Yeah, it works in practice. It works really well. I mean, the bacterial infections are pretty low. But then remember, these antibiotics are not consumed and they end up in the DDGS, which is used as cattle feed. So if all these antibiotics end up in cattle feed, and then uh, basically when they end up in the cattle feed, they end up in our milk and the meat products. Therefore, we would like to avoid the antibiotic uh, usage in the uh, process. Therefore, we want to keep this thing to the minimum. So how do we minimize the bacterial growth while uh, promoting the yeast growth? For that, it turns out that the bacteria primarily depend on diffusion of the sugar. And that happens more effectively at higher concentration of glucose. So if we, whereas yeast actually have what they call as a facilitated diffusion system, which will grab the glucose molecules from the outside of the cell and bring it inside. So yeast can function very well, even at 20 gram per liter uh, concentration of glucose, whereas the bacteria cannot function very well there. So yeast will, we are trying to give the yeast a competitive advantage compared to the bacteria so that we can reduce the antibiotic usage though, so that the DDGs that we produce will not have an, uh, antibiotics so that our will, it can be used in, uh, uh, for the production of uh, basically uses as animal feed. Now, uh, so therefore we wanted to keep this at 20 gram per liter. We don't want to keep this too much lower because if it is less than this, there is some evidence that yeast actually suffers from a reduced growth rates. So we want to maintain enough concentration that yeast can grow happily, but the bacteria cannot. That is why we have kept it at 20 gram per liter. And also, this is essentially our goal of the optimum control to maximize X3, that is the final ethanol concentration, and then to minimize the deviation of X2, which is glucose, throughout the process and keep it basically at 20 gram per liter. And what are our constraints? So we have the differential, uh, the system uh, equation uh, equality constraints, that is our system dynamics, x dot i is equal to fi. And then we have initial condition equality constraints, uh, x at time zero should be equal to x zero. But then there is also these uh, admissible control inequality constraints. So all our, remember our controls for temperature, pH, and enzyme, there is some limit. So for example, this temperature, we cannot go below 20 degrees Celsius or 35 degrees Celsius. We know that that is not good for the yeast. So we would like to operate during in that range. Similarly, for pH, we would like to keep it between 3.5 and 5. And for enzyme, this is a very interesting thing, right? You see that the rate of addition of uh, DU3 by DT is greater than zero. What that means is 
uh, we have a one way constraint because enzyme is like a liquid once you put it in fermenter there is no way you can take it back so temperature on the other hand you can reduce or increase uh, uh, ph also you can reduce or increase by adding acids or bases whereas temperature you switch on the cold water or hot water you can increase or decrease the temperature but the enzyme dosage once you add it is there throughout the process you cannot take it back so what we can we specify that as the rate of addition of enzyme is always positive that is essentially what we say or positive or equal to zero that is our constraint now we use that information to formulate uh, basically we use uh, calculus of variations to figure out this cost functional this is called cost functional essentially what it does is it takes all these uh, vector constraints that we have and turns that into a cost functional j which is a scalar so essentially it is like a number so which has all these uh, different constraints so uh, the theta here represents the initial conditions and the maximum uh, final uh, conditions so in our case we are putting our maximum final ethanol concentration at this theta at tf and then there is an integration from t0 to tf initial time to final time and there are three terms there the first term phi of x u and t as a function of x u and t represents the uh, constraint that we have throughout the process so remember that 20 gram per liter uh, constraint that comes here and then we have our system dynamics uh, fi minus x dot into lambda lambda is the uh, basically our, our parameter that we use uh, and then uh, so that is that system dynamics constraint and then is, uh, lambda is the lagrange parameter and then fi minus x dot is our system dynamics and then also we have to think about how uh, changing the controls so if i'm changing my temperature from 30 degrees celsius to 32 or decreasing that from 30 to 28 for example it is not uh, i mean free it costs money to do that right therefore uh, we need to be thinking about how we can do this and therefore, we have to have a penalty for changing the control variables. So that is what is represented by the last term. So when we have all of these, and we can use uh, different algorithms, and what we use there was the steepest gradient, uh, steepest descent, which is a gradient uh, descent technique, gradient algorithm, and it's called steepest descent. So we calculate the gradients, and then use the highest gradient to move towards our uh, goal, essentially, to minimize our functional J. So when we minimize the functional j, all these conditions will be satisfied essentially. So that is our optimal control. So the control uh, basically uh, 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 strategy that gives that minimizes j will meet all these objectives essentially. And for that, so that is all theoretical stuff. How do we actually do this? Right? We have our process model, the SSS model. So we simulate it first. It, some kind of initial conditions that we know and some kind of assumed uh, control. Uh, and then we calculate all the states, process measurement with the process measurements or estimates that we have using the equations, basically using what we described earlier. Then, so we have all the way from T0 to TF for all the states. So we use the Lagrange multiplier vector TF at TF. We calculate that using delta theta by del theta by del x at TF using the x values so we can calculate that once we calculate that we solve the lagrange uh, uh, differential equation so minus lambda dot is equal to that uh, equation there uh, backwards in time so we go from tf to t0 for solving this lambda dot uh, for getting the lambda values once we have one we have solved we have all the state information from t0 to tf we also have all the lambda parameter values from t0 to tf now, in the third step, we calculate this uh, Hamiltonian uh, as this one. Uh, so del H by del U plus del F T by del U into lambda. This is the Hamiltonian, a gradient of the Hamiltonian, del H by del U. Then we have another, uh, then we can calculate also UT into HU by uh, zero by del U. Once we calculate that, we set our delta U, which is our change in the control, uh, as this one. So minus kt into this parameter here and uh, this term here. This kt is a parameter that tells you by what magnitude you should be changing this control based on this control uh, uh, thing that you have calculated. So it depends, the, uh, this kt value of kt, it can be set as a constant. Sometimes it, uh, you're better off changing it with time, but 
it also depends on the scale of the process. So that is what it is. So this is where the scale of the fermentation comes in. Remember, up to this point, we did not really talk about the scale of the fermenter. This is what I meant earlier when I said this is a scale-free fermenter. So all the algorithm development up to this point did not talk about whether it was a 10-liter fermenter or a 10,000-liter fermenter. It works equally well for all of those. So that is a very, very big advantage of this approach that we are taking. So this is the only place where the scale of the fermenter appears. And then we update our control uh, strategy by UT at M plus 1 is equal to what pre uh, we had previously at UT at N uh, iteration plus delta UT that we calculated in step 5. Then we iterate these steps 1 to 6 until uh, we are satisfied uh, with our control uh, strategy. So it is less than an error term. And once that happens, we use that as we start off again and then implement it in the process, wait for some time, then do the same thing again. So we have to use this uh, kind of algorithm multiple times during the process. Now, so, so you see this, so we have the fermenter system, we get the information from the temperature, pH, and the HPLC measurements. These are physical measurements, as I was mentioning earlier. Comes to our theoretical model of SSF process, which gives us the system state information. We feed that into the optimal controller that we just discussed. That gives us the set point values. That is our control uh, values for temperature, pH, and the glucose dosage, which goes into the set point controller, which will control the activation of different control valves or pumps and implements that in the fermenter system. We implement it, wait for some time, repeat the whole process again. Do that repeatedly during the process of SSF. That is essentially how we physically do this. So this is the physical system that I have built. Uh, so what you see here is a fermenter, about a 15 liter fermenter that has hot water, cold water jackets around it. That has a enzyme uh, here, an enzyme pump here, a pH and uh, pH pumps there. And uh, we have data acquisition system and it is connected to a laptop somewhere on this corner. So that is essentially uh, how this whole system was laid out. Now, what are the results? So this is essentially the stuff that we got. So we typically, as I was mentioning, uh, we have fermentation for about 48 to 60 hours. So we did it for 60 hours in this case. So you see that the baseline with no controller and optimal controller without any disturbances, the ethanol concentration is exactly same, right? So you might be thinking, why did we do all this thing, right? And ethanol concentrations are exactly the same. If you look at the glucose concentrations, they are very different. In fact, we would like the ethanol concentrations to be the same, so or higher, and that is what you see at 72 hours. But we do not want uh, what because we want to make sure that our ethanol concentrations are maximized while our glucose concentrations are lower. So you see this red line that is the uh, process without the controller, and you see the blue line that is our process with the control uh, optimal control and you see that line two at uh, two that is the 20 gram per liter limit so our process controller actually maintained it below 20 grams per liter throughout the process and what you see towards the end is expected because there is not enough glucose so there is no glucose in the ferment uh, fermenter so um, it, this controller cannot magically produce it so it will go down after some time so that is what happens but it is always maintaining it below that two uh, 20 gram per liter or 2 percent and therefore it is avoiding all that peak in the first uh, 30 hours which causes normally a lot of uh, bacterial infections and uh, all the associated issues if not dealt with. So this is the optimal controller results. Now we also did a very intensive time course studies. This represents uh, probably uh, seven or eight months on the controller. So you see the results are very very consistent. Uh, the blue represents without dynamic controller, the uh, uh, blue represents with dynamic controller, the red one or the purple uh, maroon one represents without the dynamic controller. The dotted lines here represent the glucose concentrations and uh, blue for blue and the purple one uh, respectively. So you see that in all cases, even among multiple runs, we see that the ethanol concentration has not changed whereas the glucose concentration have come down. Now you may say, oh yeah, so what? Why should we go to all this trouble and do this thing? Interesting thing is, this process has used 50% less enzyme compared to this process without the DC. 
So when we use dynamic controller, we actually reduce our enzyme dosage by 50%, which is a huge deal for a plant. And I will show you the economic implications in a few minutes. So this is what our 50 liter fermenter uh, results get. And then we also have to, uh, as you all know, in the, in the control system, uh, we have to see what it looks like when you have disturbances. So we have the baseline, dis uh, baseline and uh, performance uh, without disturbances. And when we have a temperature disturbance, you see the green line there. That is essentially what happens when you have an optimal controller. So initially there is a disturbance somewhere between 24 to 60 hours or for about two hours. And uh, what happens is the performance is reduced. But then after some time, because of the way that it runs the optimal controller, it goes up and then it basically catches up. Whereas this black line that you see is the final ethanol concentration when you have a uh, temperature disturbance and you, you don't use a controller. So you see, it is about 1% lower. So this is about 30.5 and 12% uh, with the temperature difference. And remember uh, what I was saying earlier, even 0.5% difference in the ethanol concentrations makes a huge difference is plants. So essentially, yes, our controller is doing much better than what it was without the temperature disturbance. Uh, the performance is still not the same as what it is without disturbances, which is to be expected. Similarly, for the pH, we can have uh, pH disturbances primarily because of, uh, which is a manifestation of bacterial infections. So even in that case, you see that it basically recovers but doesn't recover as much. So it stays pretty much the same, the, but the performance is not degraded. Another thing is when we have bacterial infection, when we have huge bacterial infection, the results actually are not very good. So it is actually about point. 5% lower than the one without uh, with the infection as well. Uh, so there is some uh, uh, this thing there. And then what we did was uh, basically we tried to study this among multiple uh, runs and statistically speaking there is either no difference or there is a difference to the positives on the side, positive side uh, with the controller than without the controller. And uh, that is what you see in the all the processes. So now these are uh, the validation results for the 15 liter fermenter. Now, as you all know, I mean, uh, it's not sufficient if we just work on it in the lab scale. We have to take it to the industrial scale. So we took this up to a industrial scale, uh, scale uh, fermenter uh, in a 17 million gallon per year uh, ethanol plant. They had three fermenters, each of them about 1.2 million liters per so we took uh, took control of one of those fermenters that is about 1.2 million liters and then we implemented this control. So all we did in this control uh, algorithm was remember that parameter K, uh, this parameter K here in step 5, that is the only thing that we changed. And uh, the rest of the stuff basically remained the same and we implemented this there using the same temperature control, pH control, and the uh, enzyme control. And when we did that, basically these are the results that we got. So in a 1.2 million liter fermenter. So you see that the ethanol concentrations are statistically similar, although you will see that it's a little higher. Uh, the blue line uh, is a little higher than the uh, red or the maroon line. Um, you, but the ethanol concentration, statistically speaking, the same, so there is no difference in the final ethanol concentrations, but then you see a huge difference in the glucose concentrations, right? You see how different that is, and then these are for multiple drugs that we have done. So you see that it's maintaining about uh, less than 20 percent uh, in this case, too. Okay, in this case, oh, sorry. So these are some of the results that we get. So uh, Moving further, again, this is a result from like two or three, uh, no, I think this is from seven or eight rocks that we did, 1.2 million liter fermenter. Many a times, uh, one of the problems with a lot of new technologies is that they will work well if you have uh, somebody with a PhD operating on it. But real technology needs to be operated not by PhD people, but needs to be operated by plant operators. So uh, thanks to my professor, uh, Professor Mike Tumbleson and Dr. Vijay Singh. Uh, Dr. Vijay Singh was my advisor. Thanks to their uh, push, I had uh, taken this and then trained the plant uh, personnel on, on this technology. 
And then what it did was we handed it over to them. And they operated the controller for about three and a half months on their own. We did not do anything. We went out of the site and I used to provide uh, telephonic uh, support to all these people. Uh, and uh, you can see that um, this represents two of their fermenters and one with the dynamic controller. In all cases, we had basically uh, statistically similar results. Now you may say, okay, you got statistically similar results, you are doing the control, uh, implementing this very complicated controller that very few understand, but maybe yeah, you can train them to do this. What is the advantage? The advantage is that this process, when we use the dynamic controller, in the real plant operation during the 3.5 months of its operation over 171 runs used 25% less enzyme. In the lab, it used 50% less enzyme, but in the field, in the 1.2 million liter fermenter, it used 25% less enzyme than the other two fermenters that you're seeing. So, which represents a huge margin for them. And also, uh, although not uh, basically, we did not have sufficient evidence uh, to statistically test it. But anecdotally speaking, to the operators and uh, the plant managers, they told us that these, uh, when we implemented the dynamic controller, these fermenters did not suffer as many bacterial infections. They did not use any antibiotics in this. So there are two things that are going on there. People used antibiotics in all those blue dots. They did not use any antibiotics in the red dots. So, so there was, despite that, the ethanol concentrations were statistically similar and it used 25% less enzyme. And also they told us that when they saw the processing of the DDGs from these runs, it was much better quality than the other ones uh, in terms of how it looked and felt. I don't know why and how that would happen, but again, that is something that we don't have concrete statistical proof. It is just observational uh, data that we have. So this was done for 3.5 months. After this, we took that uh, controller and uh, there was a control company, uh, control system company uh, that licensed this technology and uh, they further implemented in three plants to which I support, uh, provided some uh, telephonic support. And after that, they integrated it to their control system software and uh, they implemented it in about uh, 15 or 20 ethanol plants. And I don't know after that what happened, but it is in use in many plants. So in terms of that 25% reduction in the glucoamylase uh, thing, uh, uh, enzyme, this will result in $130,000 savings for a 151 million gallon uh, liter ethanol plant, which is the median size of the ethanol plant in US for a tri ethanol. And also this uh, low glucose concentrations uh, after, during and after the SSF uh, process actually could improve the DDS lysine availability. Lysine is one of the most uh, limiting amino acids in the animal feeds. So if we can improve the uh, availability of that, uh, it is really helpful for, uh, for the cattle feed industry. So, and it improves the quality of the feed. So, again, so, so this is how we started off with a concept in the lab idea, and then we implemented uh, a system, theoretical uh, system on a computer, built a physical system, tested it out, then we took it out to field, and then uh, we tested it there successfully. This technology, we patented it, uh, and then it has been licensed by an industry partner, and we published about four peer-reviewed publications and uh, three proceedings abstracts. You will see that uh, the number of publications in this case is not too many, but the actual implementation uh, of this thing uh, resulted in real products and things like that. So this was essentially the control system architecture. The blue parts that you see, the acid and alkali pumps and the dynamic controller, those were the only changes we made in the plant. Of course, we made some wiring changes, but essentially that was it. That So essentially for about uh, twenty five to $30,000 in uh, hardware costs, we can implement this system in a plant and that will save them about $130,000 per year. So this pays itself in the first one month, actually. So this was an uh, example of a technology that we implemented. And uh, I know that uh, we have time till uh, 105 uh, to go forward and then uh, talk about the other uh, algorithms as well.
Dr. Richard, Dr. Rajiv Dev. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Okay. Well, I think I will uh, continue uh, with this. Uh, thing for a few more minutes, I think. So I'll go on to the model predictive control of algal bonds. In this one, essentially, this is uh, using a, uh, a more, uh, I would say, uh, model predictive control is used in more a new control uh, algorithm that is used in industries and it's been around for about 25, 30 years at least. And uh, we use this for uh, controlling uh, algal bonds. Uh, I mean, you must have heard about algal uh, bioproduct production pathways, and in that one, uh, we use basically there is a production pathway which is uh, which happens in open ponds or in greenhouse or in photoreactors. We harvest the algal biomass, and then that product is processed into different products. So in this one, we wanted to develop a automated algae culture management system. We can that can be used across multiple engineered different uh, algae production platforms and algae strains. So essentially, it is uh, whether we are talking about open raceways or photoreactors, we wanted to be able to control this process uh, effectively. Why is that important? Because uh, most of the times, these algal biofuels, when we talk about it, or byproducts, or uh, any of these processes, we talk about them how they are uh, environmentally friendly, and if we want to basically show that they're environmentally friendly, it is important for us to make sure that the processes are environmentally friendly. And for that, we need to operate it in such a way that it is economically viable and environmentally uh, conscious. So that is what we try to do this. And we wanted to develop and demonstrate a management system that will optimize the energetic, economic, and environmental goals of algae production system. So let's say we have an engineered algae production system. Uh, which basically produces uh, algal biomass using CO2, nutrients, and wastewater. We wanted to build a optimal real-time controller that will consider the extreme the environment, which cannot be controlled. Uh, unlike in the previous case, the temperature and pH could be controlled there. We cannot control that in an open pond. And the sunlight, we obviously cannot control it. So under those kind of conditions, so these will be considered as disturbances in this case. How do we really uh, optimize this process? So for that, we basically wanted to use a model predictive control. And here, so this is how uh, the process looks like. We have real-time measurements, uh, which uh, basically come into the genome scale model and then basically is an observer. And that observer will pro uh, provide information about the system states, which goes into uh, the uh, model predictive controller. And then essentially we have, uh, which has the objectives in terms of economics, energy, and environment, which will generate a set point profile, which will use, use to control the local controller. So uh, focusing on the objective function itself. So in order for us to do uh, develop that objective function, we uh, did a, a, a process model where we say, OK, that this is our growth model there that you see on the top. And there is harvesting hydrothermal liquefaction, converting of that algal biomass into bio oil, and then uh, the whole process. Uh, that happens there. So we wanted to generate the techno economics of it. So this was a uh, process economic model that we built and uh, which incorporates the technical parameters as well as the economic parameters of the whole stuff. And then we, uh, we 
calculate the impact of different inputs on the wastewater, uh, wastewater on the uh, renewable diesel and the area required for the plant, for example. So we look at these uh, economic parameters and calibrate them. And then we also use these uh, inputs uh, to perform what we call as an NCA life cycle assessment. So, which is essentially to figure out what are the environmental impacts. So, for example, the GAG emissions, the fossil energy use, we can figure out that out by doing an LCA. So, we first of all, we do the techno-economic analysis to get the economic parameters. Then we do an LCA to get the environmental impacts. We use that information to generate these uh, functions that will relate the cost and the GAG emissions to the inputs. For example, if you are adding nitrates in terms of milligrams per hour, what is the cost in terms of uh, dollars per gallon? Or when we add nitrates, what is the cost in terms of the uh, GAG emissions, for example? So we use these, uh, develop these functions. So now we have, in the objective function, we have a relationship between the inputs and the outputs, uh, so, and the economic objectives, for example. Once that is done, we use a kinetic model for the growth of uh, algae. And uh, so this is basically, and we validated doing a set of experiments and things like that. So you see those uh, green, red, and blue lines are the model predictions, and then the dots, so different dots are from the experiments. So we validate the model, kinetic model. And so that is essentially, this part is also that the EAPS plant model is done. Then we took uh, the genome scale, uh, developed a genome scale model for algae growth. Uh, it is called IEJ525 model. EJ represents Ankita Juneja. She was my student working on this project. 526 is the number of genes in this model that are there. And it had about 1,450 reactions, 1,230 uh, metabolites, and 526 unique genes. And uh, under autotrophic conditions, again, about 1,200 reactions and about 900 metabolites. So we took that genome scale model, again validated it through a number of experiments, and then once we validated that, we had a validated genome scale model. Then comes the observer part and the uh, model predictive part. Model predictive control, as you all know, uh, is essentially a process, uh, just like how we play chess. Uh, so we use the current, uh, we predict the future, uh, control uh, inputs, and then uh, based on the predicted states, uh, we figure out what is the desired uh, set points, and then we implement it for first one step, and then recalculate again at that step. So essentially at each step, we basically predicted for K plus P step number of steps in the future, and then develop a control, uh, uh, this thing, uh, strategy for K plus M step, and then we implement it for one step to K plus one, and then based on the measured states and everything, we recalculate again and keep doing this. So this is a indirect way of getting feedback from the system. So this is not a direct way, this is an indirect way of getting the feedback. And this creates basically the anticipative effect because we predict the future uh, behavior of the system over a finite time horizon. And because this uh, finite time horizon, this K plus P, P number of steps keeps moving. So in the first instance, when we are calculating now, it will be K plus P. In the next instance, it will be K plus one and K plus one plus P. So P plus one, so one more step. So it keeps on receding. So that's all, it's also called receding horizon control. So we basically figure out the equilibrium points of uh, the model. Then we discretize it, generate a was the state of the system based on the future control inputs. So the delta UP that you see there is the future control inputs that we do not know. Now we de design an observer, and then we put some constraints on the uh, delta UP, which is our controls. And uh, then we solve it as a standard quadratic program problem using maximizing the convex objective function subject to these constraints. And essentially, we use solve it using MATLAB. Once we solve it using MATLAB, using different Q and R functions. Remember this Q and R functions that you see here are coming from our economic and uh, basically the environmental impacts there. So that is how it comes. And the R basically controls the weights. And so we have done all of these things. So now we have developed the observer and the model predictive controller, which generates a set point profile. So then we implemented the system in uh, algal pods. And then uh, again, 
just like earlier case, we have no disturbances with light disturbance, with temperature disturbance, with uh, different types of light disturbances, and both light and temperature disturbances, all those kind of things. So when we do all that, we see that with the control, with the model predictive control, the performance is always better. And uh, that is something that we see. And uh, we see that there is a lot of, uh, although it looks very smooth in terms of the output, in terms of the actual control variation, there is a lot of control variation that happens actually uh, within the process. And uh, again, in all the cases, we see that either it is statistically different and better, or just pretty much the same. And uh, that is what we are really see. And what this again validates is that we can use a model predictive control to control the algal ponds uh, to meet the economic and the environmental objectives that we started off. And the op uh, outcomes from this process were that we filed a published new patent and then we published about three peer reviewed publications and uh, proceeding abstracts. Uh, but unfortunately, we did not take this to the full industrial scale. Uh, uh, this thing, uh, implementation. Primarily, not because the technology was any different, uh, uh, there was any problem with the technology itself. The problem was there was no market for algal biofuels. And there still is no market for algal biofuels. Because of that, because economics doesn't work out. Because of that, there were no companies that would be there to actually do this on a large scale. So oftentimes this will happen uh, that you may have a great technology product, but if the economic environment and uh, is something that is not favorable for actual commercialization, this will not see the light of the day. So this is a great example of where we have a really successful product, but it cannot be used because uh, in the field because uh, nobody will pay money to actually do this because there is no money there to be made in the algal production systems. So something to think about when you are designing your research and not to be disappointed if things don't work out because the science and the engineering and the technology developed is still useful in other contexts. With that, I would like to thank uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and Oregon State University and uh, USDA, US Department of Agriculture for uh, supporting this work. And uh, with that, I'll take up any questions if you may have. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Ganti, uh, we have some questions. Uh, I will share, I will now present some of the questions uh, that uh, participants have asked because they are live on YouTube. So there yes, they have yes. asked the question. So I am going for uh, that. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. 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 Dev, I just have a uh, small question. Uh, in yep. the middle, I had stopped between the two presentations that I was giving. Uh, was I audible throughout the thing? There was no problem, right? No, uh, no problem. Nothing reported from. Uh, there was little blurring of the slides. Uh, maybe it was some network connection, but uh, problem. But later on, it was resolved. So uh, other than that, there were no issues. Uh, so let me share. Uh, yeah. So can you see? Uh, Yes, I can see. Which class of algae generally used for this purpose? In this case, uh, we used uh, uh, basically the al algal species that are found in wastewater treatment systems because that was our uh, primary goal there. And uh, they're also very robust. So the specifically the trees that we used are actually a mixture of Chlorella vulgaris and uh, uh, you know, the same, uh, Ceridismus, dimorpha species and uh, any specific type of algae for liquefaction or any type that can. so basically you can use pretty much any algae for liquefaction and uh, thank you uh, Asta Dubeji I think uh, your question on uh, any type of specific type of algae for liquefaction so any type can be used but typically if you use any marine species uh, because of the salt concentration in the algal biomass it causes some issues sometimes so you'll have to wash it and then use it uh, for um, uh, algae for liquefaction process. And uh, Sonia, Cardian, uh, can we use this model for bacteria also? Yes, definitely, why not? In fact, that is what I meant by my comment, uh, the last comment that I made, said that uh, don't be disheartened if this uh, thing doesn't work out always, because it can be used, uh, the technology can be used in other things. So yes, this can be, for example, be used in pharmaceutical industry especially with a lot of the secondary metabolites and all the drug development, new kinds of drug development uh, that is happening. And this kind of uh, approaches uh, that we talked about, both the uh, approaches that I talked about are very, very powerful. 
and uh, will provide a, such a fine level of control that you actually can figure out when to add things, when to trigger genes, and uh, it will provide you a very, very fine control than what is typically used. And I see another question there. And yes, so sir, sir, there are two more questions that appeared in the last moment of this. Talk. No worries. I see the thing in the chat box. So Neelan yes. Shishan, use this, uh, ask this question. Instead of corn, what are the raw materials can be used to generate ethanol? Anything that is star rich in starch can be used uh, to generate ethanol. And nowadays, uh, people are also talking about second generation ethanol, which uses non-food, non-starch based feedstock, which are cellulose based feedstocks. Cellulose is also a polymer of glucose. That is a linear chain of glucose, just like starch is uh, again a polymer of glucose. So, for example, in terms of other raw materials, people have used tapioca, people have used waste wheat, people have used uh, rice, for example, the molded rice. So, if you have uh, damaged rice that you get from the flood uh, uh, damage, we can actually use that. And then uh, I see another question from uh, Basu Chetanji, uh, the detection system used for glucose. So, we basically used... Uh, a uh, HPLC system with a RI detector. So it was a traditional standard RI based detector that we show glucose machine. And then uh, can we create an IoT enabled pipeline so that we can, yes, yes, definitely. In fact, we have done that already. Yeah, we ha I did not have time to go into that because I thought that is a simpler thing than focusing on the control system. Yes, so you can actually have, because this, uh, especially for the modern predictive control, uh, that is where we have done that because the calculation of the set point strategies is very computational intensive. So what we do is we have a Arduino based uh, controller, local controller that communicates uh, on Wi-Fi network. Uh, and we have another uh, server setting which will actually uh, run this model predictive control algorithm every one hour or so and then send the set point, uh, set point input back to the local Arduino based controllers. So we have actually done that. So I think uh, I think this much uh, is the question from our participants. Uh, so I have a question, uh, though I could not attend your entire uh, lecture uh, because I had I had to take some classes. But uh, one very general question that I would like to ask you is that uh, why model predictive? Ah, yeah. Why model predictive? Yes. So the reason why we went to model predictive uh, is because uh, a few things. One. The models that we have for algal, uh, uh, basically that uh, process itself, it is traditionally not very easy to describe that. Because if you have a simple one organism in a fermenter like what we had in the first case, it is actually straightforward to do it. But when you have multiple species of algae with bacteria often occurring with all these kind of disturbances, it's a very, very difficult and challenging problem to even build a model. And a model predictive controller is actually very tolerant to those kind of issues. As long as you can get the few of the dynamics correctly, you can really uh, correct it. And then the second thing is something that relates to the last question that uh, Mr. Neelesh Nishant uh, asked, can we create an IoT enabled pipeline? Because if you want to have these uh, systems in a distributed way, uh, when you use the optimal controller, uh, model predictive controller, even if you do not, uh, if the uh, network fails and you don't have any updates later, you still have something to work with. Whereas if you have like the dynamic controller that I was talking about, that is much more suitable for a plant, uh, this thing, uh, industrial plant uh, type thing. Therefore, we wanted to go with the model predictive controller. And the last one is basically we wanted to really incorporate the uh, different uh, constraints on the economics, the environmental impacts, and the process dynamics. And uh, that could be changing, and we, we wanted something that will allow us to do that very conveniently. So, model predictive control. OK, OK, thank you. Thank you, Professor. There is one more question from Ria Goswami. Oh, yes, I see. Uh, can spectrophotometer be used to find? Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, why not? I mean, in fact, that is essentially the same thing, right? I mean, once you have your analyte, you use spectrophotometer, you use any technique. It doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. So, um, um, Professor Danti, it was, it was a wonderful session, uh, mixing so much of uh, disciplines together and then coming up with a presentation where there is a control, where there is a biological process, 
there is a bit of iot to explain uh, so so uh, i think uh, this was a nice lecture to address an heterogeneous mixture of participants everybody has to take something from here because uh, interests are varied of course so uh, it was it was a wonderful session we would uh, like to hear from you in near future too right so uh, so at last uh, a big thanks from organizer side as well as on behalf of nit center i take this opportunity to express our gratitude and sincere thanks for sparing this valuable time of yours and sharing your ideas expertise with us i am sure many people have benefited out of it or derived some idea or maybe those who are beginners here may think to do something in near future in this same line of research thank you very much professor ganti thank you so much thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you <clears throat> thank you so my dear participants uh, we have come to an end of this session uh, so the second half session will uh, resume at 2:30 pm and, uh, and and the link is still open uh, the link is still open and you can i hope you are submitting your your feedbacks so we can see many comments uh, there in the in the uh, youtube link uh, so uh, many of you are saying that you have attended the lecture but uh, it is unfortunate that uh, you could not find the feedback link i have been repeatedly writing that we are tracking those people uh, who are attending the lecture seriously but cannot uh, send the feedback link uh, so i we have requested that in such cases you can write us mail and uh, we will uh, check back with our tracking results and with the tracking results uh, and uh, whatever reasons that you write in your mail if that matches definitely will give you attendance so we are flexible on that uh, it's not uh, something to 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 uh, not to give you attendance we don't have such objectives so we will give you definitely that but uh, we could also understand from this uh, new way of uh, uh, virtual workshop that uh, uh, only 200 people are watching uh, this uh, video uh, online whereas we receive around 400 feedbacks so that is also not good and moral it's not our uh, it's uh, against the ethics that you are not attending and you are asking for link and as soon as the link is active we can see that feedback is shooting to 400 and 500 where actually only 200s are attending uh, the, the thing so um, uh, i can only request you that uh, uh, if you are really interested and you are attending then uh, we are also watching those who are live and watching interacting we are also following that so for them we have no issues even if you cannot uh, give attendance we'll definitely consider but there are people who are just just uh, for the sake of attendance uh, you are only writing that uh, where is the feedback that's not again fair enough think on that uh, issue uh, motivation that should drive us motivation for learning okay so that's a request from uh, organizers uh, nothing more on that and uh, there is one announcement that we have as i have been telling repeatedly that we have been tracking those who are really interacting responding so we have prepared a list of people who are really seriously attending interacting with our experts with us uh, through mail through youtube so uh, we have prepared a list and uh, in tomorrow's valedictory function uh, <clears throat> they will be our special invitee in google meet so they will join us uh, in uh, on the valedictory function in google meet uh, so that's a token of appreciation from our end to those participants who have really made this uh, uh, this uh, uh, workshop uh, worth interacting with our speakers uh, with us and they were serious all through so you will receive a mail from us with a google meet invitation and uh, we hope to see you 
uh, tomorrow in our validator effect uh, function at 4 30 pm okay so that's a, that's a new announcement that we have for all those uh, very serious participants who have been really attending it sincere so uh, that's all for now so we are signing off now uh, from here and um, uh, professor murthy yes you will get a youtube link as a recorded uh, video also we will send you and uh, many of the participants have requested for the slides so if you can share the slide with us uh, that will be a nice thing so that we can share with our registered participants and uh, for you we will send you the link as well as uh, the recorded videos also uh, we'll send you so uh, participants, we are signing off now. Uh, hope to see you at 2.30 PM for the next session by uh, Mr. Nishant, uh, talking on epilepsy modeling and uh, its mitigation uh, from Newcastle University, UK. So hope to see you. I hope that the lecture will also be quite interesting for us, that how an electrical engineering working on a domain of epilepsy modeling and prediction, uh, Caesar prediction of an epilepsy patients. So uh, uh, thank you all, so signing off now.